When rates are rising and cyclicality is still outperforming, I think it's a message that the market's comfortable. Are people really going to be willing to accept a 4% tenure? It seems so high to us because it's been so low. Those terrible fiscal trends are going to remain in place. No central bank is stopping governments from issuing debt. The options market in general is absolutely terrible at pricing political and geopolitical events. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Following the biggest one-day drop on the S&P 500 since April, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. It's all about the bond market jitters out there following a U.S. downgrade, some half-decent jobs data, and the Treasury announcing a ton of supply. Let the market speak for itself. Drain the drama. Yields up every single day of this week. But minor moves, minor moves. Let's get the board up if we can in the bond market. 10-year UK, 10-year Japan, 10-year Germany. Let's look at a 10-year Treasury as well. Bramo, looking at the yields right now, higher by six basis points, 413.64 on a 10-year. Highs of the year, but I wouldn't call it dramatic. It's not dramatic, but the slow bleed upward has gotten new focus as we reach some levels that we haven't reached going back to last November. And suddenly, this is the main story again. You could talk about Fitch and the downgrade yesterday, but a lot of people view that as simply an excuse to really catalyze the fears of the fiscal overhang of the new borrowing schematic from the U.S. Treasury Department, which is bigger than people expected. And this general concern that if the economy is going to recover, OK, maybe you get a soft landing, maybe you get a no landing, maybe you also get stickier inflation. What did you make of the equity market move? An excuse to sell or a reason to sell? Uh, excuse to sell. That's my gut was it was an excuse to sell for people who weren't necessarily buying the rally because they believed in it, but because it was FOMO. And we heard increasing numbers of people saying you got to go with momentum. Suddenly, the momentum seemed to shift just a touch. And so it was an excuse for people to sell who couldn't really justify it from a fundamental perspective. We've got a great guest this morning, so let's not waste any time. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly negative by 0.2%. It's a little bit softer. The move in the bond market on a 10-year Treasury getting everyone to tension this week, this morning, higher by, let's call it six basis points on a 10-year to 4.13.64. Lisa, the data was decent. The ADP report just yesterday. We've got a US downgrade. The Treasury supply seemed to be the story the day before and yesterday as well. I think that's what we have to spend a little bit more time on this morning. I would completely agree, and it really feeds into a broader concern of at what point the debt that people have incurred during the pandemic before that becomes unsustainable with higher rates. The Bank of England will have to address that to some degree today. They have their rate announcement at 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m. press conference, but Bank of uh, England Governor Andrew Bailey, their inflation picture, yes, it has been coming down, but is still the highest among the G7 nations, and it comes at a time where we hear Rushi Sunak telling his uh, population, just trust me, I can bring it down. Then today, just on the economic data front, we got jobless claims at 8.30, factory orders, durable goods, and ISM services index at 10 a.m. I am actually most interested in ISM services. Want to see if you see ongoing strength there, if you start to see a little bit of a cracking in the area that was supposed to uh, provide some momentum. And we do get uh, Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin speaking at 8.30 as well, just to count a program, and of course, Apple and Amazon. Remember, we were supposed to care about them, most of all. We still today. do. We still do. After the but close. This was supposed to be the dominant story, in my mind, for Thursday, right? To me, I thought the earnings picture would definitely cloud everything else. They've gained about 50%, both of them, so far this year. How much further can they run with the yield backdrop? Is yield, uh, the yield space, the primary story, even amid a tech rally that's been unrivaled, according to some metrics, ever? Let's see how they set the tone going into Friday morning. Payrolls tomorrow morning. The estimate at the moment is still about 200K. There's a fantastic line from Julian Emanuel of Evercore. I want to share it with you, this quote here. Throwing in the towel, upgrading one's view in the month of August has been bad for one's p &L. They top in August, September is a sell, October the panic sets in, and then you buy year after year after year after year. Who really wants to come back from the beach? Julian does. He's with us now. Julian Emanuel. Julian, good morning to you. What is it about August? The beach was boring. Um, it, look, it, it, it really is a, if you look at it, the complacency sets in, people do actually go away, and, and frankly, there are problems that tend to get papered over and wait until September. It just so happens that we're in one of these environments where if you look back over the last year, when yields have moved to where we are now, 
you've had equity market turbulence, whether it was September with the UK turbulence or March uh, when yields peaked above 5% in, in the two-year uh, prior to the bank crisis. And here we are again. And should we really be surprised given the downgrade, given the excess supply, and given the fact that Japan is now actually going to compete for funds in a global asset allocation framework? You've gone through a few points there. There's so many things going on in this bond market, and it's hard to strip out what's driving it and what isn't. The downgrade, the data, the Treasury supply, the fact that BOJ has tweaked yield curve control. Does it matter why we're here, or is it just the fact we're here on Treasury yields right now? Do the reasons behind the move matter at all? Well, it, it, look, there's always a, a – the, the longer-term picture is given the, the supply that's been announced – that is a reason, and obviously to us, that is a reason that the rate of descent, uh, should we get the economic slowdown uh, that Ed Hyman is forecasting, is likely to be lower uh, than than expected. Uh, but the fact is, when you think about it from an equity market uh, perspective, it, from the bank crisis trough till a week ago, the Nasdaq was annualizing at 100%. It's just not a surprise that we're pulling back here. Taking a step back, what you just said is that at this point, yields are making stocks queasy, right? I mean, that's essentially where we're at. And this has been one of the big questions. Why have stocks been so resilient as yields slowly climbed upward? This hasn't been a massive sudden move, as John was mentioning. So have we gotten to that tipping point where suddenly yields shift the narrative at a time when people still are talking about economic resilience and cause stocks to really look queasy, even if the economic data comes well. So from our point of view, this is a correction as opposed to an end of the end of the run. Um, and, and that's really because when you step back, even though we are looking for a recession uh, sometime over the next 12 months, the data doesn't support that in the here and now. And if you look at the history of the stock market, it's very often the case that things keep going and going and grinding higher uh, until you're hard upon the recession. And I would also point out when you think about it from a supply and demand point of view, uh, the public, who is a large holder – uh, of these stocks that have done so well, of these stocks that are reporting after the close today, doesn't have to feel forced to sell their shares as long as they have a job and the jobs market is very strong, as we know. So are you saying that we could see you know, a little bit of a dip, but nothing that significant, nothing that really portends a shift in allocations or something that's a little bit more sustained? Uh, not until the economic data uh, start breaking weaker. Um, to, to us, this is going to be, again, the seasonal garden variety, a little bit too much ebullience, a little too bit too much of the hardcore bears throwing in their towel. Just wait for the pullback and, and, and you know, You're not naming be a any buyer names, of dips. Right? No names naming well, today? look. We raised our price target in June. Okay. So, you, you know, we, we <laughs> when you say correction, 5 percent, 10 percent, what are you looking for? Here? So if, if you it's, think it's one day of losses, you know, one day of decent size losses on the S&P. We're now talking correction. So what are we talking here? So if, if, if you think about it again, uh, the, the history of this year Essentially, the Nasdaq, as we all know, started ripping at the trough in, in March. And then in June, when you got to 4,200 in the S&P 500, that's when the participation started to broaden. That's when we turned more optimistic and moved our price target up to 4,450. It wouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise if we retest that 4,200 level at some point. By the weakness is the message that you're sending this morning. By the weakness where? What kind of pockets of the market you're looking to pull back and want to buy? So, so this is sort of a barbell strategy. Okay, we are long-term believers in in the power of AI to transform industrial society. You need to own those names. The problem is, is that it, when you have a correction like what we think we're entering, those are the most volatile names. That's where you could draw down 20 or 30 percent, which is why a we like option hedges, but we also think. That the names that have been overlooked, the winners from last year, healthcare, energy, those are the names that we think uh, and the places that we think. Uh, again, you want to go where people are not, and people are not there.
With this backdrop, where does the Apple Amazon earnings picture fit in? In other words, how important is that in deciding where to start looking or how to start hedging as you head into a potentially more volatile period? So to say that those two stocks aren't going to be important is just thoroughly naive. They are going to be very important, but it is much more a function of how, and, and we've seen this, this entire reporting season, you know, you can have a good report and your stock price behaves poorly. You can have a lackluster report and your stock price behaves well. It is all about the share price reaction. Uh, and to us, again, if we look at the last couple of weeks, there's probably a little bit too much exuberance in those names. So it wouldn't be surpri a surprise that you see a modest pullback, but nothing cataclysmic. John asked me earlier, is this an excuse to sell? And are people using yields as an excuse to sell? Is that kind of how you look at the earnings of these giants that have returned 50% so far this year, give or take? And we're looking at this hope of artificial intelligence that can't yet come through in the earnings. It just isn't possible. Are you saying that there could be that kind of reaction and that then you'd be looking to buy? That's basically the story. And when you, when you think about the spend and, and the transition to a productivity bump uh, from AI over the, over the medium and the long term, those budgets aren't likely to really go into gear until mid-24 and 25. The intent is there. But again, for the stocks, you have to bridge the long-term thesis with the short-term volatility. Have you seen Tom Brady's getting into English football? Did you see that story this morning? My goodness gracious. What do you make of that, Lisa? We're <laughs> going to catch up with Tom Wagner, by the way, the hedge fund manager a little bit later this hour, who's made his push right. into championship football. So second tier of English football in the UK, Lisa. I have actually a lot of thoughts. First of all, he why Birmingham to City? Do, well, why Birmingham City? Although this is a distressed debt investor and then this is Tom Brady. And I'm wondering whether they're going to come out with a documentary or a movie because that seems to be, you know, the Netflix series of Birmingham. I mean, honestly, this is going to be very much uh, in the public eye because that seems to be the playbook. But also, you know, whether he has thoughts about the eating, the dietary restrictions and things like that, he's going to weigh in on all that. And I could recommend train. some restaurants no, in that area. I don't, I don't think that that's what no? he's talking about. About. Oh. That's just my sense. But. We've got to teach them how to say Birmingham and not them, Birmingham. Them, do you mean me? Birmingham. <laughs> I think that you mean me. Let's see how Tom Wagner deals with that a little bit later. He should know it's Birmingham. You'll and scold him otherwise. Birmingham. Duly warned. We'll see how much he knows about this city. We'll do a little test. Oh, my goodness. In about, <laughs> oh, wait, what's I, I grew that? up 30 Did minutes away from St. Andrew's Stadium. Okay. So, you know, we'll do a little personal. test 30 minutes later. <laughs> Julian, it's good to see you, mate. Julian Emmanuel, yeah. have ever call. I think it's really cool. Much more interest in football going into the lower divisions, fantastic support for some of these clubs. It's really tough to make it in a championship, really, really tough to try and get that promotion from there to the Premier League. I wonder why out of all the leagues in English football, they picked that one. And I wonder why all the teams out of that league, they picked that one. I'd like to know the thinking behind that. I'd also like to know the makeup of the investment. Is Tom Brady just along the ride for, because of the branding or has he actually put significant cash up to invest into this venture? All great questions. There is a playbook starting to emerge. And we saw this most obviously with NASCAR, but, or F Formula One, excuse me, I'm going to get pilloried in the break for making that, uh, that assessment in any <laughs> way, shape, or form. However, uh, there is going to be also this playbook that you start to see roll out, where you take a team that's kind of been relegated for a while, that isn't very popular, and you suddenly make it a movie star or some sort of TV star. And then it gets popular and you get ticket sales and you get endorsements and suddenly you can afford all of these things that you couldn't previously afford. And I wonder how much that's part of the playbook. So the way to think about it in terms of stocks, is it easier to do that with a small cap than it is a mid cap stock? Yes. Right? Yes. So, so I understand why Ryan Reynolds went for something like Wrexham. Exactly. Right? Which is like a micro cap stock in terms of the equity market of English football. And then something like, it's I find it curious. I want, I want to know. I know, but, I this want is, to know. but this is exactly what. Why the, something of that happen. size in that league? But don't you think that that could be the playbook? You take it and you make like a, a you know, made for Disney. Oh, it movie. Seems, seems to be. Yeah. I think it's better if you're the first in, and Ryan Reynolds was. And I'm, I wonder how difficult it would be to follow. We'll have that conversation later. In about 45 minutes, a Bank of England rate decision as well from New York City. Good morning. I strongly disagree with Fitch's decision 
and I believe it is entirely unwarranted. Its flawed assessment is based on outdated data and fails to reflect improvements across a range of indicators, including those related to governance that we've seen over the past two and a half years. I think we'd love to know about the improvements on governance down in Washington, D.C. That was Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Many investors weighing in on the ripple effects of the Fitch downgrade. Rubber Bank's Jane Foley had this to say. It is possible that over the medium term, the U.S. dollar will be impacted more by the political reactions that the Fitch announcement generates rather than from the announcement per se. Jane joins us now for a little bit more, head of FX strategy over at Rubber Bank. Jane, just walk us through that, the significance of what we heard yesterday to this FX market. Well, I mean, it, the significance in, in some respects from an academic sense is, is fairly huge. You know, we're, we're looking at a budget deficit that has been rising as a percentage of GDP, despite the fact that, you know, the growth outlook has improved relative to market expectations in recent months. And we're also looking at, you know, a debt that's really quite high as a percentage of GDP, particularly when you compare that to pre-pandemic levels. Now, the U.S. is certainly not alone in, in that respect. You know, there was a lot of pandemic spending. Uh, fiscal uh, policy was pretty expansionary and on top of expansionary monetary policy. And, and that's one of the reasons, of course, we have, you know, high inflation. Um, but, of course, the U.S. Treasury market isn't like other bond markets. It, it is the benchmark when it comes to safe haven. And so you don't get that same sort of reaction to, to bad news that you would have elsewhere. You don't get, you know, people selling off bonds. But, you know, it has brought the conversation back. It has brought attention back to the fiscal situation. A lot more people looking at next week's supply, for instance, in the Treasury market than they would have done otherwise. But, you know, it, it, it's, it is a problem because you, there's such a bipartisan political system. You can't have the this sort of data that, 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 that from the from Fitch, etc., imparting the sort of discipline on policymakers that you would expect to see in other countries. And, and that's potentially a bit of an issue. Jane, you mentioned the Treasury supply. Did you sense that was the more important factor behind the move in yields that we've seen over the last couple of days? I think it's part of the reason. I think you can. I think it's very difficult to dismantle, but but certainly it is there. A lot of people looking at the increase in supply, you know, across various different tenures of, of bonds, and thinking, yeah, you know, there's a lot of weight to come. Would that have been more of a focus if you know that there there hadn't been this announcement from from Fitch? Well, well, maybe not. You know, I'm an FX person, and yet you know, I've been looking a lot more at the refunding next week than I would have expected me to be normally doing. So I think that the Fitch announcement has drawn lots of people's attention back onto fiscal policy, back onto the, uh, the, the fact that the budget deficit in the US is too high, and onto the fact that, that the partisan politics mean that nothing much is going to be done about that. So, uh, you know, it, it is, it is a, a concern, and, and I think it does mean that the supply will be watched a lot more carefully just to see how the market absorbs it next week. You said you're an FX person and I have to say this incredible irony that we're dealing with the potential for a further downgrade of the U.S. or some sort of fiscal irresponsibility leading to a protest among investors leading to dollar strength and the likelihood that that's going to continue at least in the near term. How disruptive is that? How much do you pile on this dollar strength kind of train after a lot of people had abandoned in it for months well you know again I, I think there's various different aspects to this outlook for the dollar as well and and you know that the safe haven bid may be related to the US fiscal situation may be one aspect but I think it's more to do with the resilience of the US economy you know look, look at the the ADP number that we've had look at um, a variety of economic data coming through saying mm, you know where is that slowdown that we were expecting that the whole part of the first year in, in, in the US can be, I don't know, determined by just the word resilience. We saw so much economic resilience. Look at the stock markets, etc. So I, I think now the market is thinking, OK, maybe we cannot completely discount the risk of another Fed interest rate. We certainly can't dis discount the risk of higher for longer interest rates. And at the other side of the coin, you know, you've had Brazil, for instance, cutting interest rates already by 50 basis points. Some of those interest rate cycles in emerging markets are far more mature than in the US and you've got this position certainly in, in the ECB or with respect to the ECB where actually rates may have peaked there too at the 
maybe coming to, to towards the end. Even in the Bank of England, we, you know, we can see the beginning of the end there. So, um, you know, the, the dollar story I think takes on a different context when you look at the other side of the trade and and you see potential weakness elsewhere. But how much room do you see to run at a time when you do have the potential for a pause at the ECB, where people are expecting the Bank of England to hike by 25 basis points today? That's the, the general call at this point, and then maybe even stay there for the, the time being. Well, we've got to remember that the market has gone into, you know, the, the, into the, this ECB and the Bank of England meetings really quite long of both, you know, the euro last week and, and, and sterling this week. So those positions may have come off their recent peaks, but they're still pretty long. And that's really important because if you go in into a meeting long, then obviously there's more scope for disappointment. And we've seen sterling today underperform a bit. It's, it's about the weakest G10 currency today. Maybe the market are just, is just taking some of those profits. And, and that doesn't surprise me. You know, a few weeks ago, people were, thinking, were fairly certain that there would be a 50 basis points hike. Now the market has seen more chance of a 25 basis points hike. I, I would be in that camp. And, and that's because, you know, there are signs of weakness in the economy coming through. And, and the Bank of England should be picking that up in their agents. We're certainly hearing from, you know, our corporate customers um, in the food and agri sector, you know, that, that their customers are making different decisions now, probably because of the, the impact of inflation and the impact of interest rates on their budget. So I think the Bank of England should be picking that up. And I think there's just going to be a 25 basis points move. And some of those long positions are, are reacting to that. Never mind Bailey. Governor Ueda has had a, quite a week, hasn't he? Jane, what is the Bank of Japan up to? Ah, well, that's what we're trying to figure out. You know, it, it, it is quite interesting that they've come in twice, you know, since last Thursday today and uh, again in, in unscheduled bond purchases. And this is really important because this is really allowing the market to draw more information about, well, what exactly did they mean last week? So we, we, we saw a tweak in policy. You know, to what extent was that, you know, just a technical move to, to help with the, 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 the better functioning of markets? Or how far are they going to allow bond yields uh, to push up? So we're getting more information. They certainly don't want a quick run to to 1%, although they did say that uh, immediately after that their move last week. So we know that there's a tolerance for you know, some increase in 10-year yields, but just not too far just yet. What we don't know is that if that's going to change um, over, the, over time, will, will they allow us to move up to 1% in three months or six months or, or nine months? We, it's, it's very difficult to determine. But you know, what I will say is that there is some positive economic data coming out on the wage front um, in Japan. We did have um, a positive announcement from the, from the a recommendation from the government with respect to minimum wages. We've seen some more data showing some tightness in, in the labour market. So at the, if the fundamentals are moving in the right direction, um, in terms of moving away from this very um, uh, soft monetary policy. But we all know it's going to be pretty slow. Hey, Jane, thank you. Jane Foley there of Rubber Bank. We're all trying to figure out what the Bank of Japan is up to. It is clear, based on actions of the last week or so, they don't want to take the elevator up from 0.5 to 1%. They want you to take the stairs slowly. And each step is like 5 to 10 basis point increments. Then they come in, $2 billion of purchases. A few days later, you would start to climb 5 basis points. They come in couple of billion dollars of purchases. So is this the playbook that every day they can go up about five basis points and then Who until knows? they reach 1%. The question is, why did they set the target at 1% for 10-year yields, that that was when they were going to come in and buy, if they didn't want the move to be straight to 1%, right? So what was their thinking in terms of setting that as a sort of benchmark and then penalizing people who want to bet on that benchmark, right? I mean, that's essentially what happens. If you are a trader in Japan, and I believe there are about five left, of bonds, but if you start being to... being generous. <laughs> if you start to, you know, really try to work out the valuation, you're just playing with fire. I mean, you're just daring the Bank of Japan to come in. Technically, the target's still zero, and the ceiling's still 0 0.5, but it's not a ceiling, it's not rigid, and they'll come in at 1%, but they haven't just come in at 1% every single exactly. day. They've come in at, like, 0.6 and 0.65. I'm still trying to figure it out. It's been a week and two days of action. I'm not sure anyone really knows what's going on still. Equity slightly negative from New York. This is Bloomberg. Equities on the back foot. Cricket term, I think that is, so excuse me. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative by 0.2%. The Nasdaq down by about 0.36%.
Looking at the Russell, we're softer there by 0.1%. Equities down for the last couple of days, and maybe we make it day three on the S&P 500. Yesterday on the S&P 500, the biggest one-day drop going back to April, the first drop bigger than 1% since the month of May. And the blame game has been played in the bond market. The yields are up this morning by a couple of basis points on a two-year. It's the longer end where we've seen this move. The 10 years up by six basis points, the 4.1385. The 30-year is up by six or seven basis points, the 4.24. Lisa, we're at highs of the year on a 10-year. And I do think we have to try and strip it down to what was driving things in the last 24 hours. Was it the supply? Was it the better-than-expected economic day to the ADP report that people don't care about until they do? Was it the downgrade? <laughs> Is it the BOJ yield curve jitters of the last week or so, or is it just all of the above? Well, it had been creeping higher, right? It wasn't like suddenly there was a seismic shift upward. The yields had been creeping higher, and suddenly people care about it. And perhaps it's because we've breached those thresholds of year highs. But it's also because of the supply. And I say this because on Tuesday evening... When the, when the news really broke about the Treasury Department and what their plan was in terms of how much they were going to issue, you saw a pretty significant move in the 30-year yield. This was a direct response to the expectation of more supply at a time when the Fed was not going to be buying because they're stripping down their balance sheet, at a time when there are fiscal concerns, and at a time where there are the BOJ operations and a whole host of other issues. One trillion this quarter, up from what we thought was going to be about 733, 733 billion only back in May. That's the story with the bond market. Let's just finish on foreign exchange. For the euro at the moment, we're shaping up as follows. We're negative here by a tenth of 1%. Stronger dollar, 109.24. Stronger dollar against pound sterling, too. 126.54. There was a feeling only a month or so ago before the latest CPI print that maybe the BOE goes 50. And now it's been paired back to 25. I would say the consensus is around 25, but some people still think, Bramo, in 30 minutes' time, maybe they go bigger than that. How much does this all have to do with home prices? How much does this have to do with the fact that people are getting really concerned about suddenly their mortgage rates spiking? I mean, we hear this from Rishi Sunak a bit. We're going to hear more about it. It's going to get worse based on how these mortgages are going to roll off in months to come. I would say this backing away from 50s, more to do with just CPI came in a lot softer than anticipated. That sort of bailed out. Maybe a little bit, Governor Bailey. But I still don't know. I think it's on a knife search, 25 or 50. And if they deliver 25, can they back away in the same way Chairman Powell did and give you the um and ah about the next meeting? Or do they have to lean into the idea that maybe there's more to come? If I look at the notes coming out, a lot of people are talking about 25 and done from the Bank of England, which still has a 7.9% headline CPI rate and is the highest among G7 nations, which shows just how much the narrative has shifted away from further rate hikes globally. Sterling right now, 126. 53. Under surveillance this morning, the Bank of Japan wading into the bond market for the second time this week to slow gains in benchmark sovereign bond yields. The central bank adjusting policy to allow for 10-year yields to rise to as much as 1% on Friday. But its actions this week making it clear it won't allow it to happen too fast. Yields just creeping a little bit higher, Lisa, in today's session. Hello, confusion. I mean, honestly, there's, there's nobody who really understands what's going on here. I mean, uh, one fund manager over in Japan said it's too early to tell whether they are focusing on the level or speed at which yields rise. And if they are focusing on speed, what is that speed that's allowable? Is it five basis points? Are they going to keep coming in? Or is there going to be a new level where the levels matter uh, and they don't want to re raise uh, rates all that much? de facto, in a de facto manner. But who is trading this? Again, who is playing this ch game of chicken with the Bank of Japan? That's what I was wondering. The BOJ owns half of the market, if you can call it a market. All of this bond market stuff drowning out the politics. Today, something truly historic once again, the former President Donald Trump, due to appear in a Washington federal court later on, after being indicted on Tuesday on charges, he conspired to obstruct the 2020 presidential election. The 4 p.m. hearing is the third criminal court appearance for the former president. AMH is going to join us in about an hour from now, so look out for that conversation. I also wanted to squeeze in this as well. We touched on it briefly. If you're just joining us, welcome. We're going to be talking about this in about 15 minutes. Six-time Super Bowl winner Tom Brady turning his attention to English football, investing in Birmingham City as a minority owner. Brady is investing in the second-tier championship club alongside hedge fund manager Tom Wagner, who purchased a 45% stake just last month. The pair have also invested in Pickleball, 
together. We're going to catch up with Mr. Wagner himself, Lisa, in I think about 10 minutes. Again, I want to understand the entertainment and the sort of marketing factors behind this. We know that Tom Brady is a genius at marketing with a whole host of uh, a number of endorsements and products. How much that's going to be part of reviving a team that has been on the back foot for a long time? Is this going to be a story of revival that will be represented in, you know, movies and Netflix series? I hope so for the local area. I do. And the long-time rival across town, Aston Villa. I will disclose that the English side of the family are Villa fans. So mm. I'll, okay, I'll so you're going to come in with boxing gloves on? No, I just, just to put that out there. I don't support Aston Villa. As everyone knows, I'm an AC Milan fan. Tom Tatsouris joins us now, Head of Fixed Income Research at Statiga, a bad company. Tom, good to see you, buddy. Yeah. Good to be here. Great to catch up. Let's talk about this bond market. Lisa and I spent the first, I don't know, 35 minutes of the show trying to work out what was driving things. Was it the data? Is it a BOJ? Is it a downgrade? Or is it just down to what we think it is, the supply coming out of Treasury? Well, I think it's all of the above, but let's start with the BOJ. This really started with the BOJ's decision last week. What the Bank of Japan has really done here is they've reduced the global demand for sovereign bonds. And they're doing it slowly, as you mentioned. They're not red letting that 10-year that JGB rate ratchet up to 1%. So they're being cautious because the speed does matter here along the way. But that's the first kind of step here to getting us to the point we're at right now where bonds are in, are in turmoil. That reduces, we'll call it the demand surface for treasuries, bunds, JGBs. Then you have the refunding announcement, which came along uh, on, I should say, you had the Fitch downgrade, which came along on Tuesday night. That's going to also reduce demand for, demand for treasuries. Then finally, we get the refunding announcement where the treasury says we're going to upsize our coupon auctions by 2 to $3 billion per month across pretty much the entire coupon stack. So it's a supply issue as well. If you throw in some strong economic data in there and you're really getting a flight from quality at this point in time. Now, we think that's going to be fairly limited because the longer this goes, the more it's going to jeopardize the economic expansion. It's going to jeopardize the financial markets. But for now, right now, investors are stepping back and saying, we're going to wait to see how far yields rise before we step in. You're in touch with the buy side. Let's go through that a little bit more. Is there that demand waiting there to come in and lock in something with a forehand over 10 years? Uh, we think absolutely there is. Let's just focus on the 10-year Treasury. There's an awful lot of, we'll call them plain vanilla funds, that would love to step in and buy a 10-year Treasury at 4%, let alone 420 or 430. But they want to see how far this goes because they're not levered investors. They're more or less benchmarked investors, and they want to wait until kind of, you know, things stop falling and they'll step in eventually but they're waiting the fact that they're waiting though is telling what are they waiting for what's the all clear signal well i think the all clear signal would be that you have a capitulation where you start to see um shorts just absolutely getting squeezed which is not happening yet and you see um sentiment really just turned completely bearish on treasuries that would be your buy signal to step in so we could look at things like the cash market we could look at whether or not certain instruments are trading uh, special in the repo market. That's just not happening yet. So that's telling us the shorts aren't yet offsides. And we do have Bill Ackman betting against 30-year treasuries in the options market he put out on Twitter, saying uh, that basically everything going on, he can't yeah. see the bull case for 30-year treasuries. That said, where will they settle out given this global backdrop, right? I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, there's more room to run for the sell-off. There's another thing to say, just going forward, it's going to be a higher risk premium yep. on some of these securities simply because of this backdrop. Yeah, absolutely. And now we have multiple time horizons here because first things first, we may, might have to get through a recession in the next, we'll call it six to 12 months, which could easily push Treasury yields 10, 30 or Treasury yields lower. But when we get through that to the other side, you're looking at long term demand for long duration, again, uh, beginning to deteriorate in the expansion. So we're talking about Treasury yields settling higher highs and higher lows into the next business cycle. So where should 30 year Treasury settle? Well, realistically, we'll say something on the order of 25 to 50 basis points north of 10 year Treasuries. And 10 year Treasuries should probably start to settle around 5% in the next cycle. That's not right now. We've got to get through this for this recession first, supposedly in the next few, few quarters, but beyond that, around 5%. That is the reverse of the previous 30 years. Yep. Bob Michael was in your seat from JP Morgan talking about exactly the same thing. Higher lows, higher highs. Yep. We had this headline from Mike Gapen of Bank of America just yesterday. It was about throwing in the town on the recession call. And of course, a lot of the media went with that call, including myself. And then you actually read the note. And further down the note, the real call is the rate cut call from Mike Gapen. And I'm going to share the numbers with you. Just 75 basis points of cuts in 2024, 100 in 2025. 
and he thinks we get an additional rate hike. So you think about the kind of numbers we're coming back down to. He's thinking we come back down to maybe four yep. on Fed funds. That is completely different to everything we've seen over the last 15 years. Yep. Is that where you think we settle down at, something in and around four, if they do indeed start cutting? Uh, what I've been saying is somewhere around three and a quarter, now 350. Now I could see maybe a 375 to four. So we're raising our floor on the Fed funds rate. Four might be, I think we go a little lower than that because I think inflation is going to come down to about 3% and stay there. And maybe even go a little lower for the next, we'll call it six months or so. And so the Fed has some room to come down to maybe a 350. But I don't want to split hairs here. They're not coming down to 1%. They're not coming down to 2%. They're coming down to something above 3%, in my opinion, in the next downturn. So 4%, certainly reasonable. How much have the events of the past couple of weeks changed your investing outlook? in terms of higher benchmark yields and potentially more longer-term refinancing risk, frankly, for a lot of companies yeah. that may have avoided having to refinance till now, but at some point are going to have to face it. Yeah, what this is doing to us and in our view is helping shape our view is that the bill is coming due fiscally for the U.S. government, for state governments, and for corporations who have had way too much debt and have been able to use cheap financing to kind of keep – cash flow going. The bill is coming due. So what this means is we should have not only steeper government curves, but steeper credit curves going forward. When that happens exactly, well, we probably have to get through this recession. But again, on the ups, on the other side of the recession, we're probably looking at higher borrowing costs for everybody from U.S. Treasury to Apple to triple C credits. Are we underestimating how much this is going to bite? Lisa mentioned the housing market in the UK. If you're coming off a two-year fix, five-year, whatever it might be, your jump up in mortgage costs is just going to be – it's going to feel for some people astronomical. Yep. And if I think about some of the coupons that some of these high-yield companies are paying from debt they issued several years ago, when they have to come back into the market and reissue wherever that maturity wall might be, the step up yep. is going to be so severe. Are we – putting our head, burying our head in the sand on this one and not really thinking through how large the step up in interest costs is going to be? I, I think we are. And, and I think part of the reason for that is because on the sidelines for the last, we'll say, six to 12 months has been this surge of private credit, which has been helping to kind of facilitate the transition towards higher interest rates, particularly across the lower quality corporate portion of, of, of the credit space. That will not be there forever as a liquidity backstop, and eventually many of these companies are going to have to come to market, do public bond issuance at much higher rates. That's probably not happening this quarter or next quarter, but next year, absolutely. This was great, Tom. It's going to get your thoughts. Tom Titoris of Strategus. At least this is going to slowly bite, and then all at once. And it's going to bite in different ways in different places. Obviously, the UK mortgage market, and we've talked about this so much, is so different to what we experience in the United States. If you've got the 30-year fix um, at 2% or whatever it is, Great work. Well done, you. Well Just done, you. Welcoming it's it's, into the, it's honestly, yeah, I know. It's, it's real, real envy. It's, I know. It's real envy. I wish. You're welcome. I wish. <laughs> I but you're going to see it bite. But you're, you're going to see it bite in a material way. And this, to me, I think that you ask exactly the right question. Are people accurately really pricing in or understanding the implications of this? Can you price it in if it's that far out? Because people want to make hay while the sun is shining. They want to take uh, take advantage of a rally that seems to have legs. But longer term, if we start to reassess that the Fed, and not just the Fed, but the ECB too, is going to err on the side of not raising rates higher, but keeping them at these levels for longer, that could be potentially more economically damaging than if they were to overshoot and then have to retrace their steps. You stay at four. You come down to only four. If that's a new floor, if Mike Gapin's right, you'd imagine that's going to hurt. Just a bit ago, a year ago, two years ago, we were talking about average investment grade bonds below 4% all in. So if you think about all these companies who have refinanced, well, what's the premium suddenly that they have to pay in an era where money costs something? This is going to be a sea change for markets that finally might see some of the pain of getting back to normalcy. Bank of England rate decision about 17 minutes away. We'll take a break from the market just briefly. We're going to catch up with the Birmingham City Football Club chairman, Tom Wagner, we're going to do that next from New York City. This is Bloomberg. The trajectory, our fiscal trajectory, is concerning. And but we're a rich country and we've got time to deal with it but we need to do some things 
in, in, in the next few years to, to change that trajectory. And to do that, it's going to take doing things on both the spending side and the revenue side. You can't do with just one party. You have to do them in a way that commands broader support across the political spectrum, and you have to build that. What a timely conversation. Former U.S. Treasury Secretaries Hank Pulse and Tim Geithner catching up with David Weston for Wall Street Week. No doubt you'll hear more of that on Wall Street Week through the weekend. I want to skip the markets just for a moment and get straight to this conversation. Joining us in the studio, I'm pleased to say Tom Wagner, the Birmingham City Chairman and Co-Founder and Co-Chairman of Knighthead Capital. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Purchasing Birmingham City. Mm -hmm. I think we've just got to start with this. We've spoken a lot over the years about Americans getting into English football. And Lisa and I were talking about how many leagues there are in the United Kingdom. Why this league and why this club? And if you were thinking of all of these clubs as opportunities to invest in, what was it about something of this size and this location that got your attention? Well, after a year of really looking at the landscape of English football, we were drawn to Birmingham for a number of reasons. England's second city, one of the youngest, most diverse populations in all of Europe. It's a city on the rise that is going through a significant transformation. So all of that made the city of Birmingham quite attractive. Uh, and then add to that a team that had been uh, underinvested in for a long period of time. And, and frankly, to us, seemed quite a bit like a sleeping giant. You know, it, it seemed impossible to us that you have the second city in England with the named team in the championship. And so we felt that there was a huge opportunity to really make a difference. As you know, that league is highly competitive, very, very difficult to get promoted because you also have to face the teams that got relegated from the premiership sure. who have got all the money to try and get back up a league. So why this league? That's what I'm trying to get my head around. When we think about the lower leagues of English football, a lot of Americans have been introduced to Wrexham and what Ryan Reynolds is up to. Lower league club, maybe get a little bit more, more, bit more bang for your buck. You get that promotion, you get some more. Right. Why this team in this league? Well, it's a team that had been in the middle of the table for a significant period of time. And we felt that there were substantial resources available. And by the way, this isn't just about the men's first team. We have a spectacular academy. We have a women's team that we think is poised to be, you know, one of the best in England. And I think when you, when you take all those things together, coupled with a very large natural fan base, we just felt that the team was underperforming, meaning the club itself was underperforming from the perspective of treating the fans properly, being a real part of the community and embracing this incredible natural fan base that it has within Birmingham. So if, if we provide a product that is actually commensurate with the value of the city, we think that there'll be great things ahead for the club, you know, and beyond. So I know you from a previous life when you focused on distressed opportunities and you came in here, you said not distressed opportunities, turnaround situations, <laughs> yeah. which is applicable yeah. to this. And I'm wondering at a time where there is so much interest in investing in sports and mm -hmm. football, if this is the playbook more people are fi following as Middle East money kind of pushes everybody out of the top leagues. Well, I think that when you look at the investment from sovereigns there, it's very difficult to compete in the, the highest level of the top tier in football. Um, but there's an enormous opportunity to compete in you know, everything else within, within football across all of Europe, frankly. Uh, but I think English football was particularly appealing to us for the reasons I cited earlier. I mean, it's a, it, it was really very much about Birmingham and what we believed was a city that was going through a significant transformation. And we felt that the, the club could play a big part of that. You've taken a 45% stake alongside Tom Brady. Leisha and I were talking about this. Is Brady just along for the ride for branding? Has he put real money into this venture alongside you? Yeah, he is not here for promotional purposes. And obviously today is all about, you know, having Tom uh, be very visible. But really what it's about is Tom bringing his expertise following a 23-year career in the NFL, which is highly competitive, as everyone knows, where he had unparalleled success. I mean, it's if you think about the fact that Tom played in 10 Super Bowls in a 23-year career, won seven of them, um, was only you know favored, I think, twice, if I remember correctly, uh, in those Super Bowls, that's a pretty incredible track record. And his, his level of excellence never really tapered off. So it's about bringing those learnings 
to Birmingham. And so Tom will chair our advisory board. He will have a significant role in health, wellness, nutrition, you know, effectively human sustainability, um, and will play a role in how we think about uh, player interaction. So will we get to watch what it means to have human sustainability on a Netflix series that's coming out shortly? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I think, you know, those things would be uh, fun and exciting, but our, our principal objective is to really bring what worked for Tom and, and having known him for a long time and witnessed firsthand what went into his, his success over a long period of time, you know, this is, these are legitimate um, uh, activities that really do play out in a positive way and how, and how our athlete performs. We can't just let Will C hang there. We've got to dig a little bit deeper. Are there talks with anyone currently about doing something on the media side? I think, you know, if you look at Birmingham, there, there's one individual that I think really stands out um, as, as it relates to producing fantastic content, and that's Stephen Knight. So if we were to do anything along those lines, we'd have to engage with Mr. Knight and see whether or not he were interested. So he's a wonderful guy. He's produced some and, and created some amazing content over the years. So it'd be really exciting if something like that could it happen. It the question as to whether, when you came up with the appropriate price to play for this, whether content was something you were thinking about at the same time in the same way Liberty Media did with, say, Formula One. Was that a consideration? It, yeah, everything is a consideration, right? And it starts with what is the product that we're delivering to the fans? It has to be something that is worthy of, uh, you know, the city, the people, the fan base and their passions. And, and when we went to uh, our first game, it was not consistent with what we felt the fans deserved. So that will that will be the beginning point, right? It's it's about an overall experience, and that experience goes beyond just match day. You know, you want to provide content, you want to provide enjoyment to the fans all the time, so that they really feel a part of the team and they can be proud to support the team. And ultimately, part of that is drawing in fans from beyond simply Birmingham. I mean, I think Tom's involvement brings in a lot of attention. Having Undefeated as our kit sponsor on the men's and women's team. First time the same sponsor has been on both uh, the men's and women's jerseys. Doing that, so we have this connection with an LA-based streetwear brand. These are different things. It brings a level of attention to the club that I think is, is demonstrative of how we're going to approach this, which is to do things differently. Is the monetization going to come more from the content and the branding of it or the actual ticket sales, right? Is the idea sort of the larger thrust All of, of the it. team? All of it. It's got, you can't do, I think in sport today, you can't be successful doing one thing properly. You have to do everything properly. And this is a business, you know, to some degree. It's obviously one that has a lot of passion behind it. But we have to think about, as you would in any business, getting every element of the business right. So we have to think about promotion. We have to think about the product that we put out. Not just, again, not just the tickets and the product on the pitch, but also what's available for the fans. Do they like the kit that they're able to buy? Are there good pieces of swag that they, they would enjoy wearing, right? All of those things matter. And then you can think about partnerships, and obviously commercial partnerships here will be critically important, and we're looking for the right commercial partners to, to begin this journey with us. I promise that corporations that step up and, and become a partner with us will have a long ride that they won't regret. It's early days. Let's talk about defining success. Have you seen that success already through season ticket sales picking up ahead of the oh new season? Gosh. Absolutely. It's been... Is it a multiple of this previous year? It's... Well, we, we're... The stadium capacity is what it is, but we are well ahead of where we've been in prior years. We're going to increase stadium capacity by roughly 50% um, with some repairs that had been long needed. So we'll open a substantial number of additional seats. There's safe standing that's going in, which is something that the fans really want. Um, there'll be much better hospitality. I think everything in that regard will, will increase. But ultimately, the goal will be to, you know, keep people coming back. And that, and that means that the match day experience has to be enjoyable. And I think we'll measure success based on, you know, can we make continued improvement? I mean, everyone would love to see a spectacular season right out of the gates. Um, I think we have a team that's perfectly capable of doing that. But ultimately, it's about, you know, keeping our eye focused on the long goals, which is consistency. So let's do this. Let's agree now. I'll get a camera. You get Brady. And we'll go down to St. Andrews in the new season and we'll do a bit of content ourselves. That would be cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> That'd be great. We'll That'd that be happen. great. I We'd would love to see that. Thing. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> It'd be fantastic. Very cool. Tom Wagner, thank you and good luck for the new season. This is very cool. Tom Wagner there of Nighthead Capital. 
This is really interesting, Lisa, to see how this is going to develop next couple of seasons. I think I just heard an invitation to Stephen Knight to come join Was that, the, that join too? The, yeah, okay, yeah. great. British screenwriter. Well, pie. we'll get everyone together. We'll do that. Bank of England raid decision just around the corner. We'll get Governor Bailey to come. <laughs> I think that would be great. Down Broad See Street, what he has Birmingham. To say. Yeah, why not? Why not? Futures negative here by a quarter of 1% from New York City. Good morning. When rates are rising and cyclicality is still outperforming, I think it's a message that the market's comfortable. Are people really going to be willing to accept a 4% tenure note? It seems so high to us because it's been so low. Those terrible fiscal trends are going to remain in place. No central bank is stopping governments from issuing debt. The options market in general is absolutely terrible at pricing political and geopolitical events. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It comes another rate hike live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Brambert, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Some interesting moves in the bond market developing over the last 24 hours. A downgrade from Fitch, the United States losing its AAA credit rating. On top of that, we've seen some better data in America. A ton of Treasury supply coming to the market as well. And some tweaks to yield curve control from the BOJ. Some confusing actions from them as well over the last couple of days. This is from the BOE just moments ago. 25 basis point hike from 5% to 525. That was the consensus view. There was a feeling, though, that maybe they might go 50. So it's 25 from the Bank of England over on Threadneedle Street. Looking at the move on Sterling at the moment, just slightly weaker off the back of this. At the moment, cable 126. 50. Going through this decision outside of the Bank of England for us is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, you've had a couple of seconds to go through some of the headlines. What jumps out for you? Look, this is what markets and economists had expected. There had been a bit of a doubt whether it might be a 50 basis point hike, but after that cooler than expected uh, June inflation print, they had thought it was going to be 25. Look, this is going to invite criticism of the bank's reaction function, that in this decision and in the last decision, they're just reacting to what's just happened, that they're focused on the rearview mirror rather than the road ahead, given you've got a two-year supposedly lag in monetary policy. I thought it's interesting as well that you've got a three-way vote split here. Haskell and Mann going for a half-point hike. The last time you had a, a three-way vote split, which is what Bloomberg Economics had expected, had to to them was uh, December uh, and yeah it'll be interesting if you give us a minute to have a look through all of this John <laughs> while Megan Green's voted because she uh, is the new member of the Monetary Policy Committee replacing Silvana Tenreiro the Archdove of course. You take 60 seconds Lisa and I'll talk about it around the table. Lisa it's something that Tom talks about a lot and we miss TK today. TK often talks about the dissent the lack thereof at the Federal Reserve Never mind one voter turning around and saying, I disagree. You've got a three-way split on the BOE. What you feel is the angst that nobody knows exactly where inflation is going and how exactly the Bank of England has a projection of CPI ending this year at 4.93% and then getting below the target in the second quarter of 2025 without a recession, without experiencing a real negative growth trajectory, still growing in 2023 and 2024 by 0.5%. So lackluster, but not exactly uh, the same kind of depression that people were calling for, eight-quarter depression uh, that people were saying uh, just months ago. Lizzie, we need you to explain this, because in America we don't do dissent on the Federal Reserve. It hasn't happened for a long time, or at least it feels that way. Lizzie, can you explain what a three-day split, three-way split actually is on the BOE? What does that look like? look like this morning? Well, look, we've got divided data here in the UK. I mentioned that CPI print, finally a downside surprise, but inflation still nearly at four times the Bank of England's target. At the same time, you've got hot wage growth here in the UK. So, of course, you're going to have a split in the committee, uh, some would say, uh, over what the Bank of England should do now. It's interesting that you mention about the forecasts because that has political consequences as well. The Bank of England seeing inflation ending the year as you say, Lisa, at 4.93%, so below uh, half of where it was at the start of the year.
year. And of course, it's Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister's number one priority to halve inflation by the end of the year. He's also made it one of his top five priorities to grow the economy this year. So he'll be rubbing his hands, popping the champagne. Oh, he doesn't drink the, the Diet Coke, I should say, <laughs> because the, the Bank of England doesn't see a recession for the UK this year. When you talk about dissent, there is a question of how exactly inflation is going to get down to that kind of level so quickly at a time when the UK still has entrenched inflation, service side uh, pressure, expected growth, unions that are striking, a situation that a lot of people say will leave inflation much stickier in the region. Yeah, Lisa, you paint a really difficult picture of the UK economy, and indeed it is. But there are those on the Monetary Policy Committee, fewer of them admittedly now, uh, who argue that, look, you've done all of these rate hikes so far, you need to wait for them to take hold. How can you say that there's an 18-month to two-year lag in monetary transmission and then wait a year and be impatient uh, for, for them to, to take hold? That's Lizzie. the Dove's argument, but clearly they're not winning. I'm not sure what the noise is, but it seems to be getting very noisy over at the Bank of England. Lizzie, thank you. Leave Good me. to catch up. Wonderful work, as always, from Lizzie Burden over in the United Kingdom. Over in the square mile outside of the Bank of England, just a programming note for you. If you are watching in the UK, or listening for that matter, at 7.15 Eastern time, so in about 10 minutes from now, our UK viewers will have continuing coverage of the Bank of England and Governor Bailey's news conference, just anticipating that. So some special coverage around that for you. Here in the United States, we'll carry on with the market coverage for you. And this is how it works on the MPC. There's nine voters, and this is the three-way split. One voted to hold... Within the eight that voted to hike, two were looking for 50 basis points. So that's your three-way split, Lisa, this morning. And just to be clear, Megan Green, who just joined uh, the MPC board, she did vote for the 25 basis point hike. This is the split that highlights the lack of consensus that we feel on the Fed, too, but that hasn't gotten represented in actual dissenting votes. And I do wonder when you start to get this percolate out. And what this means for the Bank of England is that they're at a threshold where people really don't understand the trajectory of inflation. That's my that's my take on this. You know, Tom would be obsessed with the dissent at the Bank of England this morning. Well, it's all he'd talk about. You know what he would say? What would he say? You guys just do it better. We'll just do it better. Everything we'll over there better. is just better. Just do it better. What's it like being there it's and everything's amazing. being better? We just do everything better. <laughs> That's Tom, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Sri joins us now. Sri Kocha Govindan, the senior research economist at Aberdeen. Sri, wonderful to catch up with you. Let's just start with your initial reaction to that latest decision from the Bank of England. Thank you. So we were expecting a 25 basis point hike today. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of debate beforehand, and I think it's quite interesting to see that three-way split with two members voting for a 50 basis point hike. There are a lot of justifications for that, actually. Um, but what's really shifted at, in our mind is the activity data is a little bit more sluggish. And what the Bank of England and many other central banks face is a clear trade-off between inflation, tackling inflation, and then managing growth as well. And in the UK, the growth picture has been quite sluggish throughout the year. So that's, that's a, a key sort of overview for now. I mean, going forward, we do expect there'll be another hike in the next meeting, another 25 basis points is going to be needed. Inflation is very sticky and it's that international comparison that's very interesting. Even though we had a downside surprise in the last uh, inflation print in June, core services still very, very sticky. And this pace of deceleration is a little too slow in comparison to other countries. And that's a key problem for the Bank of England. So you can understand that three-way split and that division there. So can you help me understand then the difference currently between what the UK is experiencing, what the Eurozone is going through, and what we're witnessing here in the American economy? What's the big difference between the three at the moment? I think the one of the issues with... Um, this actually applies to all of them, it's the tightness of the labour market. But I think the UK has a slight differentiation there in that... Uh, some of those wage pressures are quite accelerate. They've, they've still accelerated, even though inflation, headline inflation is starting to roll over. There is some good news on the on the horizon in terms of energy costs and food prices. These are starting to decelerate. But the UK labour market is particularly tight. And um, part of that has been COVID related. There's a, a higher proportion of long term sickness. 
being reported as part of one of the reasons, um, but also lack of migration. There is a, there is a, some frictions there in the labour market that, that are more persistent. Do you buy? Uh, in- do you buy the uh, assessment that the Bank of England just came out with, Sri, that we're going to get inflation below 5% in the United Kingdom by the end of this year and below the 2% goal by 2025? I think that will be quite challenging. I think what's necessary, unfortunately, is a recession in order to trigger that deceleration in core inflation and core services. So perhaps inflation, headline inflation, there is a, a good trajectory on the horizon. In July, we'll see a big drag from energy bills being cut. So the, and food prices, which had been particularly sticky in the UK, that was another difference for the, for, for the UK as well. That's starting to decelerate as well. But it's the labour market and core services issues, um, wage pressures, industrial action. All of this is quite a heady combination. So it's going to make it very challenging unless there is a, a recession that that helps trigger this uh, further deceleration in core prices. There is a phrase we hear at all three central banks at the moment. It's sufficiently restrictive. Lagarde talked about that in the last week or so. We heard that from Chairman Powell as well. We're hearing that from the UK. Is there evidence, based on what you're seeing, three, that they are sufficiently restrictive? I think we're very close to the peak, the terminal rate, actually. Um, we, as I said, we do expect another 25 basis points. But from there, it really depends on you know, the data. As they say, they are data dependent. But it really depends on how much that core services actually starts to decelerate. It doesn't seem that they're quite restrictive enough. But I think it's quite interesting in today's statement, they did add a line to really emphasise how rates would stay high for a meaningful period of time. So that's something that's very much in line with what we're expecting. Until the recession does materialise, we can expect high rates for, for a period of time. So that policy restriction, past and future, are still feeding through into the economy. And that's still going to be a trend we'll see. So you want to feel to jump on and get in front of the camera for us in response to this Bank of England decision. Sri Kochagomadan there of Aberdeen. This from the Bank of England just moments ago then. This is what they're saying, Lisa. They want to ensure that bank rate is sufficiently restrictive for sufficiently long enough to return inflation to the 2% target sustainably in the mere term, in the medium term. How many times have we heard that now in the last week or so? And we're having this debate as to whether we actually are sufficiently restrictive in the UK, in the Eurozone, in the United States. So ECB executive board member Fabio Panetta had a a comment earlier this morning that I thought was telling that it matters more how long you hold rates high than the level that you get to. And I wonder if that's the playbook now, that hopefully the idea is to get a sustainable level where you can keep it there without having to cut rates soon, without triggering something. And that, I think, would be something that markets would have to grapple with. And what happens is over time in the mortgage market, for instance, the effective rate carries on climbing because people have to refinance at a higher rate. And this type of stuff, stuff can take a while, can take time. Sterling at the moment, 126.48. We're negative here by 0.5% on that currency pair. From New York, if you're just tuning in, welcome to the programme. The S&P 500 is negative here by 0.2%. Coming up at around 8 a.m. Eastern time, so in about 48 minutes' time, John Stolfus of Oppenheimer on his bullish S&P 500 target, looking for a record high, Lisa, later on this year. Then at the bottom of the hour, so in about, actually about 20 minutes or so, Jim Zalta of Apollo Asset Management. He's going to be joining us very shortly. Looking forward to that as well. Very much so, especially with the yield space and how much that's really changing any of the scenario for uh, Jim Zelter, but also uh, for uh, what we heard out of Oppenheimer, this idea, John Stolfus saying that we're going to hit a new record high Does that get curtailed by this idea of yields being substantially higher and not coming down anytime soon? Does it matter why they're high or just that they're high? Well, it matters in as much as is it sustainable or is it a trigger, right? Is it something that's going to just be a blip and then yields are going to come back down? But if it has some staying power, it does change the scenario. It changes the risk-reward dynamic in a more material way. I'm very curious to hear what he has to say about that. Remember what Chris Verone said. He basically said yesterday that you should worry if yields are higher and defensives in the equity market start to outperform. And literally that same day, the outperformance came from where? Staples, Staples. utilities, healthcare, on a day where the yield curve was steepening and yields were up at the long end. Chris, do you want to tell us something about what what you were looking at? What did he know that we didn't about yesterday's session? Evidently, but definitely some warning signs. Now, if that continues, then, you know, you've, you've got an issue. Is it more about the bond supply that's coming than 
The economy today to which is surprised to the upside. How many people are going to come on and say, when that dip happens, we're going to buy. We're going to be buyers. I mean, that's essentially what we're already hearing. I've seen it already this morning, exactly. haven't we? From New York City, good morning. I want the American people to know that I had no right to overturn the election. And then on that day, President Trump asked me to put him over the Constitution. But I chose the Constitution, and I always will. And I, I, uh, I really do believe that uh, anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. With regard to the substance of the indictment, I, I've been very clear. I had hoped it wouldn't come to this. Scathing words from the former vice president, Mike Pence, and 2024 presidential candidate. Quite a day coming up down in Washington. The former president, Donald Trump, set to appear in a Washington federal court after being indicted earlier this week on charges he conspired to obstruct the 2020 presidential election. That would take place at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Anne-Marie joins us now down in Washington, D.C. MH, just set the stage. What we can expect in the nation's capital later on this afternoon. Well, obviously, security is gearing up for the former president's return to Washington. He's going to make his way here. He's currently in Bedminster at his golf course, and he'll be arraigned at 4 p.m. He'll, he'll hear these charges against him, four charges, including conspiracy to defraud the United States. Uh, potentially, though, there are other things that we remain to be seen and whether or not the president is going to make a pit stop like he did in Miami to a local Cuban cafe. Would he do something like that here in Washington, D.C., to try to get those spontaneous moments uh, in the media where he really thrives and becomes a showman. Uh, but he will be here at 4 p.m. in the nation's capital to hear these charges against him that for at the moment are the most serious when you look at all the indictments that the former president has faced this year. Well, we heard some of the allegations then just a second ago. Amory, how significant are the words of his own vice president, Mike Pence? I think that Mike Pence's comments yesterday were incredibly significant. Once you, you also saw Mike Pence actually start to troll the Trump team as well, saying Trump and his, quote, crackpot gaggle of lawyers. So this was a harsh criticism towards the former president and the people he surrounded himself with. Many of them are known as um, co-conspirator one, co-conspirator two. We don't have their names yet, but you can kind of understand in this indictment who Jack Smith is talking about, Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, these individuals that the president surrounded himself with. But this was another interesting line, Jonathan. You have Trump's lawyers out on the TV networks talking about that Trump just wanted Mike Pence to pause the voting to make sure they can go do their investigation. And this is what Pence said. The American people deserve to know that President Trump and his advisors did not just ask me to pause. They asked me to reject voting, return the vote, essentially to overturn the election. So he is basically lining up with what Jack Smith and the special counsel is alleging against the former president. So these are two current presidential candidates that are duking it out uh, in terms of the rhetoric. And it raises a question, Anne-Marie, of where the money will end up going from big corporations, from Wall Street at a time when there's sort of a circular firing squad a little bit on some sort in some areas and others vying to get some of the diehard Trump voters. Tim Scott, the senator uh, from South Carolina, uh, holding fundraisers with a host of Wall Street uh, figures. How much does this really highlight where potentially some of the momentum might shift? So at the moment, a lot of the big donors are on the sidelines. They want to see who can start to potentially rise in the polls, because when you look at the polls, Trump is absolutely crushing the field. And we saw that this week with the New York Times Siena poll, more than 50 percent. DeSantis, his closest second, is at 17 percent. There's a lot of hope on Wall Street and some of these big money donors to put money into DeSantis. That started to uh, they started to really ratchet that back when they saw some missteps in his campaign. And now they're looking for potentially who can break out, which is why the debate is going to be incredibly important in three weeks time in Milwaukee. And you bring up Tim Scott, an incredible fundraiser in terms of the names he's about to bring in the Hamptons on August 9th. And let me tell you how much money it will be to cost to go there. It is going to cost in the thousands. Um, hosts needing to contribute $10,000 per couple or $5,000 per person. You're talking about names like Gary Cohn, um, individuals besides Stoning 
ton global. Governor Bill Haslam, the uh, former Tennessee governor. These are some big names in the Republican Party. And potentially they see a path for Tim Scott, who at the moment is low in the polls, but people seem to like what he has to say and the story he wants to tell to voters. Emory, this morning we've been talking a lot about bond yields, and we've been talking about the importance of the debt profile and the increase in issuance from the Treasury for markets. When it comes to the presidential campaign, how much more do you expect to hear about fiscal sustainability at a time when we know it is politically uh, dead in the water to say that you're going to cut Social Security or really uh, make some amendments to some of the entitlements? Well, we've already seen a little bit of divergence between the Republican candidates when it comes to social so things like Social Security. So you have the former President Trump saying he would never touch it. Then you have others saying that at some point we have to look at how we're going to structure this to make sure that it, it does not go insolvent, which is on the path to do. So you have heard from some individuals like Pence, like DeSantis, saying that potentially there needs to be tweaks in it, not to impact individuals now on the upper age range that are about to receive it or are currently receiving it, but those that are much lower in their 20s and their 30s. Obviously, when you are running for president and you definitely want votes in the, in the Republican Party from those that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s, this is an interesting line, a tight line that you need to walk and you need to be careful because we've seen the pushback on it. But there are individuals that are talking about it, and the, and the economy is going to be a major talking point for the Republicans. That is what many of them want to talk about, and they constantly pivot when you ask them about Things like news of the day, a Trump indictment, a third one, they constantly want to pivot to what they say issues our people are talking, out, talking about outside the beltway. Just quickly, Anne-Marie, is there any more response from the Treasury Department since the Fitch downgrade because of the sell-off that we're seeing, because of the increase in issuance, because of how much yields are going up and what that's going to do to their funding costs? Well, the Treasury Department, if you're talking about like what happened with Fitch yesterday, they say that this is outdated, it's arbitrary, it should not have happened. Um, Janet Yellen also spoke yesterday. And she repeated all of this. She says that Fitch is relying on outdated data they should not be using. Uh, the one interesting point that I keep coming back to that Fitch pointed to in their report in June, and then you heard Richard Francis of Fitch talking about this yesterday, is at the same time he mentioned the debt burden the U.S. is facing, he also mentioned the political polarization, and he directly spoke about January 6th. So if there's going to be growing political polarization in Washington, D.C., and Greg Vallier talked about this note today, can we expect more downgradings of the U.S. credit ratings? AMH, thank you. Anne-Marie on the latest down in Washington, D.C., just going through the invite list, the hosts for Tim Scott in East Hampton, Mark Rowan, Apollo, Stan Druckenmiller, Gary Cohn. It's quite a list when you go through it. I love that MH shared the prices there. You don't get a discount for a couple, Bramo. No. So if we went together and we tried to host, you don't get the couple's discount. It's 10K per couple or 5K per person. Yeah, and that seems to be the way he's going to raise money, and it doesn't seem to be a problem for these people. So was that concerning for you? For the you Tim Scott Victory the Fund. Now I'm thinking of crowdsourcing for an invite. <laughs> Is that right? To see, uh, Just to see how wait, these things operate. Hold on a second. If you crowdsource for an invite, would it be to talk to Tim Scott or would it be to talk to all of the people who are attending to it? To talk to all of the people exactly. who are attending it. I mean, I'm curious yeah. to see where Wall Street's money is going to go because it's been sort of a pause up until now in terms of where they really put their, their hump. He's an interesting guy, isn't he? I mean, Jim's outer of Apollo is coming up shortly, and Jim's probably thinking, please don't talk to me about what Mark Rowan's doing in politics. And Jim, we're not going to. Don't worry. We're going to talk about this bond market and Apollo's earnings that came out, Lisa, a little bit earlier. We can ask about it. No, we won't. Don't no? worry. <laughs> he we're just gave me this look. I'm, no, no, we're not going to do it. Honestly, it'll be uh, TK Wood. Tom's moment. not here. So you keep like, we're not going to ask you about this. But, but, but tell us about yeah, well, you know, you what it's like Are to go to East Hampton, and you know, you're going to go and attend that get together that fundraiser. <laughs> if you are just tuning in, there's a news conference that starts in a couple of minutes' time shortly with Governor Bailey. We'll bring you some headlines from that from the Bank of England. They just hiked 25 basis points over at the BOE. Sterling off the back of it stays a bit weaker against the US dollar. At the moment, we're at 126.54. We have this unusual thing in the United Kingdom at the Bank of England. They dissent, and it was a three-way split. So eight voted for a hike, one voted for a pause, and within the eight voters, two wanted to go bigger than 25. They wanted to go 50. So that's the division on the committee at the Bank of England currently. From New York City, this is Bloomberg.
Biggest one-day drop since April on the S&P 500, trying to bounce back and struggling to do so. Equities right now on a bit of a losing streak. We're negative here by 0.3% on the Nasdaq, down by 0.4. As Lisa mentioned, we've been looking forward to earnings from Apple, from Amazon. Barely talked about it all morning. They report later on after the close, making up close to 17% of the Nasdaq 100. So that's a chunky weighting and something worth looking for a little bit later. The attention, though, has been fixed on the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year looks like this this morning. Yields creeping higher higher again by six basis points, 413.85. We're looking at new highs for 2023 on a 10-year yield. You have to go back to October for the post-pandemic cycle high, just north of 430 on a US 10-year. So short of that, but certainly through the highs of the year, through the last couple of days. On a 30-year, up by six or seven basis points, 424.15. Now, pick your poison. What is it? The economic data, better than expected, downgrade from Fitch. Or well, Lisa, was it just the amount of supply coming out of Treasury or the BOJ and not having a clue what yield curve control is anymore? My gut says it's not the economic data. And the reason why is because this has been entirely led by the long end, not the front end. This isn't about Fed policy. This is about longer term supply and demand dynamics, longer term, who are the buyers going to be at a time when globally the Bank of Japan is essentially reducing some of the desire for international uh, developed market bonds. These are really major factors. It wasn't like the cyclical parts of the equity market did well yesterday, was it? It was all highly defensive risk aversion, utility, staples, healthcare. They were the outperformers through much of the session. Basically, the things that you stock in your basement and prepare for uh, tougher times. And this is exactly what we heard would be the clarion call for some sort of shift in momentum. And that is exactly maybe what we're starting to see around the edges. We'll actually have a chance to ask uh, whether that's the case over at Oppenheimer in just a little bit. Early days, early days. I want to finish on foreign exchange. Have a look at what's happening with the euro and sterling, if we can get to that now. The euro at the moment at about 109.32, negative 0.05%. Sterling on my screen, negative by 0.4%. 126.58 against the US dollar. Under surveillance this morning, the Bank of England raising interest rates to a new 15-year high. Warning its fight against inflation may require tighter borrowing conditions for a prolonged period. That could be the ECB, the Fed, and now it's the BOE. Members of the MPC were split three different ways. So you've got to think about this. There's nine members on the MPC. One didn't want to hike at all. Eight wanted to hike. Two of those eight wanted to go 50. The rest wanted to go 25. <laughs> That's the Bank of England at the moment. That's a real split. I want to understand why. Why some of them wanted to stay. Why some of them wanted to raise by 50 basis points. Is it an idea of theory of where we are at inflation? Or is this an idea on the sustainability of rates at a certain level? And that will increasingly become the question, right? Is it because they believe that rates are sufficiently restricted if holding for a longer period of time? Or is it that they think that, you know, they need to go more or less based on inflation? It's a subtle difference, but it actually matters. No, quite it's a really bit. important. I think you mentioned the mortgage market. And if you just take the effective rate on the outstanding mortgages right now, it's close to 3%, I think, up from two from when they started hiking interest rates. That's going to climb higher as some of those fixed rate mortgages end and they've got to go back to their banks and get a new mortgage. And when you refinance, you're not going to be getting 2%, 3%. You'll be getting something closer to 6 if you're lucky at the moment, maybe it has a five handle. And this is where Tom Zatsouris uh, earlier of Strategus was actually really important and, and said some really profound things about how longer term, if we start talking about a Fed that doesn't cut rates, a Bank of England that doesn't cut rates materially, that changes the financial backdrop in a material way that people are not prepared for. That is when you start to see the shakeout from 20 years of zero rate policies. Let's get some answers to some of these questions, we hope, in the news conference. If we don't get them there, you'll get them here. 11 a.m. Eastern time, an interview with Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey sitting down with Bloomberg at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The BOJ is confusing, waiting into the market once again for a second time this week to slow gains in benchmark sovereign bond yields. The central bank tweaking its yield curve control in the last week was said to come in every single day if yields are at 1% and then they've come in twice in the last week with yields nowhere near 1%, Lisa. It just seems to me they're trying to manage the pace of the journey. I'm not sure about the destination, but certainly trying to manage the pace of it in the last week. At some point, maybe it'll become about the level and not the pace. I mean, these are the uncertainties of a central bank that has clearly made a major tweak after no tweaks and basically negative rates for a very long time. 
And it's leaving a lot of people wondering what the implications are. I keep going back to this, though. Who's going to bet against this arbitrary target that they have? Where is the free market going to say, OK, we'll play ball with you, Bank of Japan? So what kind of traders are out there actually doing this? I mean, honestly, if I were a trader, would I really have the stomach for this? I'm just That's wondering. That's sweet, you know, free market in Japan <laughs> well, and, and the I Japanese mean, government bond market, free market. OK, so they own half the market. The market doesn't trade some days. Who's left to trade this stuff? Where do you make a market? I mean, just the physicality of a market like this, when you start talking about the Bank of Japan coming in at certain levels, I mean, it's just mm. an incredibly strange dynamic. That's one dynamic. Here's another one. Former Treasury Secretaries Hank Paulson, Tim Geithner, Wang in on the Fitch downgrade, speaking hours after the government lost its AAA rating from Fitch. Paulson telling Bloomberg, our fiscal trajectory is concerning. We're a rich country. And we've got time to deal with it, but we need to do some things in the next few years to change that trajectory. Paulson's successor, Geithner, saying, you want to move the system to act before it's late and hard. Those comments coming with uh, David Weston and Wall Street Week over the weekend. Look out for that. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, Jim Zelta, co-president at Apollo Asset Management. Jim, I'm just going through a record profit over at Apollo Global Management, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Just allow me to get your views, Jim, on what took place in the last couple of days in this bond market and the US downgrade. Jim, how did you and the team respond to that just yesterday? Well, not, good morning, first of all, and pleasure to be here as usual. I, you know, certainly, um, you know, from a, from a macro perspective, I don't think there's anything new in this message of uh, warnings of our fiscal uh, situation in terms of the long term. But, you know, for us, I think the bigger picture is all of the, the news of the last 24 hours and the last few weeks that you've been discussing this morning, uh, what's really happening is there's a higher cost of capital around the globe. Um, as the market gets more comfortable with a higher rate environment, uh, obviously inflation has been stubbornly high, but there's, a, there's going to be a higher cost of capital. And whether it's refinancing rates or the high yield wall of maturities in a couple of years, um, companies are going to be confronted with a higher cost of capital. And so how that, you know, um, impacts the economy, the transmission mechanisms, um, but it's still a very interesting environment to put capital to work. Uh, if you have the right type of capital. Jim, do you buy this idea that we were hearing from Tom Tsitsouris that when we get that maturity wall in two years' time, if rates aren't materially lower, if, say, they get down to 4 percent, you could see a real shakeout, unlike what we are prepared for or that anyone is calling for? No, I, I think it's, 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 I don't want to say it's the likely outcome, but we, we would say when we think about the outcomes of the next 24 months, um, it's our view that financial conditions are indeed tightening. It takes a while for the impact of rates based on our economy being so services and consumer driven for that to really uh, filter through, if you will, and have a broader impact. Um, but certainly I, I would say when we look at our purview from our perch uh, and the business that we've grown, um, you know, financial conditions will and are getting more challenging. They're getting more challenging in, in, in England and in parts of Europe. They're going to get more challenging in certain industries in the U.S. And that is how we think about the world in 24 and 25. So, you know, al along with the evolution uh, of how capital gets provided, um, certainly the higher cost of capital and tougher financial conditions are what we would expect as a base case. But going back to our business, I mean, I was last on in April. The world's changed dramatically since the middle of April in terms of what concerns were about the banking crisis and liquidity. Um, and now it's really more of a business issue. But our, our, our company's had a, a resilient and tremendous record quarter. Um, we've really positioned our business to do well in a period of higher rates. There was some skepticism a couple years ago, but certainly this is a, 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 a potentially a golden time for private credit. And uh, between private credit and our alternative asset business, as well as retirement services, we are, are very uh, excited about the success and resilience of our platform. Jim, one thing that in the private credit world has been happening on the heels of some of those banking failures has been a shift into consumer credit increasingly, consumer loans that are not being provided by an increasing number of institutions. Are you doing that as well, funding some of the, you know, less prime mortgages and uh, not less prime mortgages, excuse me, less prime uh, auto loans and things of that nature? 
You know, it's a, it's a small part of a business. We, we have 16 platforms and, and 4,000 people out there every day uh, providing capital to companies. And, and uh, for the most part, we're really more of a corporate and industrial lender. We have small parts of our business that are in the uh, mortgage space, the, the residential mortgage space and the home improvement space. But that's a small portion of our business. Um, and I think one has to be appropriately cautious as you're uh, engaging in the environment that I described where, you know, consumer pressures are probably on the rise over the next six to 12 months. So the answer to your question is we have small exposure. Um, it's one where we are making sure we're top of the capital structure with the highest uh, rated counterparties. Uh, you saw some other firms have large concerns about their consumer business. Uh, and we have to, I think you have to tread very carefully uh, in, this, in this transition of, of tighter financial conditions when you talk about the consumer in the U.S. or the U.K. Jim, I want to talk about a deal you have done, a deal you've brokered, and a deal not yet done. Can we start with Carvana? What was attractive about that to you and the team? Just walk us through how that came together. Well, Jonathan, we, we, we've been an investor for, uh, for several years, and certainly we think there's a lot of great attributes to the business model and, and the, uh, you know, what, what they're trying to pull together in terms of it's a very large market, it's, a very, it's not a concentrated market, it's very dispersed. Um, and as we got more involved with it, certainly that company, as they grew, they did take advantage of the low cost of capital provided by the high yield and bond market the last couple of years. Certainly in the last 12 months, as the world has changed and the cost of capital and the impact of that on their balance sheet and their, and their financial condition, they realized that they would be better off pursuing their long-term growth by having a less levered balance sheet and more equity in the balance sheet. So we worked in a very consensual manner with management, with other bondholders, and arrived at a situation where it's a win-win. Uh, the company gets to continue to execute its business plan in a, in a less levered structure. Uh, bondholders get paid down, equity gets raised. Uh, and I think you're going to see, I, I think that's a precursor for what you're going to see on companies that have healthy uh, upward trajectory uh, opportunities. Um, that, you know, there, there is capital for companies to delever and equitize their balance sheets. There's certainly a lot of, of tech or software businesses that have great inherent growth, but that's really, in our, in our view, you know, that was a playbook for how to appropriately and constructively uh, delever a balance sheet of a, of a company that has an upward trajectory. Jim, some of the companies less healthy. I'm thinking of one trucking firm, Yellow. Can you walk me through if you are in talks with them about providing fresh cash and what those talks look like now? Well, certainly, you know, Yellow is a company that the, the, the fortunes of its business have changed. It's, prob it's not where any one of the constituents that are involved have liked to see the situation uh, develop and, and arrive where we are today. But it's one that's probably, uh, it's better I don't specifically talk about it, but I think the company, we're, we're in, in dialogues to allow the company to f fulfill a, a, a process to uh, deal with their constituents, their, 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 their lenders, uh, in, a, in a thoughtful, measured manner um, in an important time for the company. Well, out of respect, I won't dig too deep. Jim, let's catch up soon when you've got an update. Jim's out of there of Apollo Asset Management on a record $1 billion profit over there following earnings released a little bit earlier this morning. From New York City, if you're just joining, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 negative here by 0.26%. Coming up in the next hour, looking forward to this, Tom Porcelli has a new seat over at PGM Fixed Income. He'll react to jobless claims just around the corner. More economic data going into payrolls tomorrow. The estimate for payrolls tomorrow, 200 k That drops at 8.30 Eastern time tomorrow morning. Coming up next, we'll hear the thoughts of Adam Poston of the Peterson Institute for International Economics and whether these lags lease are a longer variable or, as Bill Dudley said in a piece for Bloomberg Opinion earlier this week, they're just super short and they've already hit and they've already gone. Adam Poston was one of the first people to say, you know what, this Fed is going to accept uh, an inflation rate that is higher than their 2% target. They have to shift it. And I'm very curious to see whether he's saying the world come to his side and agree with him, essentially, at a time when you can argue about the long and variable lags either way. Inflation has been stickier than most people have imagined. Do we settle down at something like three to four and they make the decision that you don't want to hammer the labor market to get it down to two? That it's just not worth it, especially in an election year. Just saying. Oh, political. I wasn't going there, but OK. Future's negative from New York. This is Bloomberg. Double eight.
plus is the second highest rating we have. It's not it's not a low rating. It's not you know it's still a very high rating. It just means we're just saying that we do not think that the the underlying fiscal story and or and the governance uh, it, it, you know is compatible with AAA anymore. Richard Francis standing by his call, the Fitch co-head of America's sovereign ratings, cutting America from AAA to AA. Some controversy, politically speaking, down in Washington, D.C. around that. For a lot of other people, they just shrugged their shoulders. But we did have a move in the bond market in the last couple of days. Yields up, Treasuries down, softer off the back of not just that decision, but also better economic data again, the ADP report, upside surprise. The Treasury supply, which is worthy of a mention, that got announced just around the same time that we heard from the likes of Fitch and that downgrade. Then all this manoeuvring around the Bank of Japan and yield curve control, which we're still struggling to make sense of, Lisa, even today. You put that all together and it has just turbocharged a move that had already been underway. What I find interesting is that the shift in the bond market after this downgrade was completely opposite of 2011. And that is important. Basically, yields higher, bond price lower, versus everybody piling into treasuries back in 2011. The growth backdrop back in 2011 was just brutal. Eurozone debt crisis. Exactly. Not going away anytime soon. It was just totally different to what we're experiencing currently. Looking at sterling, Bank of England with a rate hike, 25 basis points, 50 minutes ago. Sterling just a bit weaker on the session going into that decision. Weaker on the other side of it as well, 126.67, the pound against the US dollar. With us now, I'm pleased to say, Adam Poston, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Adam, wonderful to hear from you. I think you know where Lisa's going to go, so I'll set that yeah. up for you guys to dig into in just a moment. Let's just start with the Bank of England. You get sure. the feeling these hiking cycles out Adam, are coming to a close. I feel very confident the hiking cycle is coming to a close in the Fed and likely in the euro area. I remain less persuaded or less confident that we're at the end of the hiking cycle in the UK, Jonathan. I mean, the Bank of England has been saying in the last three prints fit their narrative and the latest YouGov survey fits their narrative. We're really the same as euro area and in Fed, as far as monetary policy, we're just a little lagged and a little higher, but it's just going to come down in due course. It's a legitimate point of view, clearly. But I think that there are reasons why inflation is going to persist higher for longer in the UK. And the risk of an upside hit on inflation is still bigger in the UK than, say, in the US. Adam, you said that you think that this is the end of a rate hiking cycle for at least the Federal Reserve, maybe not the Bank of England. And it seems as though a growing number of people are coming around to what you were talking about, that the Fed is going to allow a higher inflation rate than 2 percent. Maybe it's going to be 3 percent. Are you that much more convinced that this is really the reality that we're heading toward? Lisa, thank you for raising that. And yes, definitely. Uh, whether the Fed acknowledges it after a few years of saying two means two on their inflation target or dawdles it out over some all of 2024 before their strategic review is an open question. I'd rather they say openly this is what they're doing and raise the target to 3%. That's in question and how what that matters is in question. But I don't think that there is any stomach and I, on the FOMC majority to grind the economy down that last bit to get unemployment up an additional amount to get from 3 point whatever to 2 point below 2.5. But what does that mean, Adam, when it comes to the threshold to cut rates? And this is actually one of the big questions that we have out there because people are saying the Fed's going to cut rates and they've conceded this before inflation gets to their target, will they start cutting rates even if it's clear that inflation is going to stay around 3 percent or 3.5 percent? I think they'll be re reluctant to do so, uh, as they should be, frankly, unless, again, they, they raise the target and make a, acknowledge that that's what they're doing. If they are still committed to two and then they start cutting before rates, before inflation is down, unless you have a really obvious terrible shock like COVID spring 2020 or Russia invading Ukraine, you're just not going to be able to justify it. I think the SEP, it is interesting, as you point out, that the, the forecast for inflation, the dots, and for the committee is that they start cutting rates towards the end of 2024 when they're not forecasting the inflation being back at the 2% target till late 2025. I, I, that is a bit 
hard to swallow. Of course, it's still easier to swallow that than walk the cuts in the next six months. And then there's one man who is guessing, sensing that maybe these lags aren't long and variable, maybe they're super short. I want to share this quote with you, Adam. I don't know if you've read the piece from Bill Dudley yeah. earlier this week on Bloomberg Opinion, but certainly thought-provoking. This were his words. There's considerable evidence that lags have shortened, meaning that the economy has already felt nearly all of the impact of the Fed's actions. And I wonder if that comes up on the committee of the Federal Reserve. I'd have no idea. But if it did, and you had the opportunity to contribute to that conversation, Adam, what would you say? I think Bill's piece was very insightful. I'm not convinced of his argument that things were shorter, um, because you also then would have to say they're softer. But I am convinced of the need to push back on the narrative that the Fed's at high risk of over-tightening and lagged effects are yet to come. Um, and that it, that topic is definitely in the mix of the committee, John, and it should be. So, um, well, this so is, would, yeah, go, go ahead. I just, sorry, I would just say that we already had the surprise that the forward-looking residential construction market, which usually is the most interest rate or one of the most interest rate sectors, did not shed workers. So, and of course, consumer behavior in terms of durable goods and things like that has not shown a monetary policy effect. So my view is that the impact has diminished, not that the lags have lengthened or shortened. If you look at that right now and you end up with inflation staying high, the Fed poised to cut before inflation goes uh, to their target. How high could inflation go or stay longer term? I mean, how? what is the consequence to allowing a drift in target at a time when people really are feeling inflation and it's affecting at least their sentiment, at least what they say, maybe yeah. not what they're actually doing? Fair, a fair enough point. And this is why a lot of people, including people like Frederick Michigan, formerly of New York Fed, who was co-author with Bernanke, Laubach, and me on the inflation target book, inflation targeting book, are opposed to raising the target. I believe Rich Clarida, the former vice chair, is also opposed to raising the target. I do think, though, the reason to raise the target is we're looking at a much more inflationary period, not just over the next year, but going forward. Larry Summers gave a great speech at Peterson about a month ago talking about the medium-term fiscal outlook for the U.S., notwithstanding the hubbub over the Fitch ratings, but the idea that we're going to be spending more on elderly, much more on green investment, much more on defense for a sustained basis for several years. And then that's also going to be happening in much of Europe, in China, in Japan. This is something that's probably going to drive up long rates, half a basis point, 75 basis point, if we see a sustained one and a half, two percent expansion in deficit. We've also got, as Gita Gopinath from the IMF has pointed out, and you, I think, were talking about this when we were at Jackson Hole last year, you know, that there may be a sequence of energy price increases, be they shocks or be they deliberate policy, I would hope for both. But then the, how does the Fed accommodate that? And then finally, going back to where you started this conversation, they said there's the labor market. The 2% the inflation target was a good guess at a certain time. But even at that time, there was debate, including with George Akerlof, talking about whether you needed to be able to grease the wheels of the labor market by having a slightly higher inflation target so that you were not up against the, the real zero bound, which is people get fired instead of cutting nominal wages. And so for all those reasons, and this is stuff Olivier Blanchard has been arguing for years as well, for all those reasons, inflation targets should be higher on the merits. So it would be better to make that clear. Is this going to lead to drift? That's why people are reluctant to do this. It's a real concern. But my view is if you've successfully and credibly taken inflation down from eight and a half, nine percent to three and a half percent, you're credible enough. Adam Posen at the Peterson Institute. Adam, always wonderful to get your insight on this program. Thank you, sir. And looking ahead to Jackson Hole in a few weeks' time, no doubt we'll see Adam over there. Who do you remember that morning? <laughs> I was oh, yeah. freezing. I cannot even begin to tell you how cold I was. I almost fell off the chair. I was freezing. I yes. almost fell off the chair. I was that cold. And that was Adam Posen in shorts and a short sleeve shirt, just sort of tolerating getting, you know, not a care in the world. Do I remember Speaking it? Speaking clearly, no the... shivers, nothing. He was totally fine. I remember sitting there just in awe, wondering what kind of superhuman talent he had to generate internal heat at a time when it was, what, 40 degrees out? And speak coherently about central banks. Honestly, some <laughs> of the stuff we do in the mountains. <laughs> 
<laughs> Go like to Jackson. Oh, I just don't. I don't. I don't get hiding it. Hiding behind Why you, do we do waiting it? to pounce. Davos in the mountains, right. outside in the snow. Because it's beautiful. Jackson Hole in the pitch black. Be, it's like you know freezing. I'm going to be on the group marches. It's just stupid TV stuff. Through the woods. I, no, I no interest in that at all. I think you should come. John Stolfus, Oppenheimer, bullish next. We know the fiscal trends in the U.S. have been bad and will continue to be bad. The trend in yield is up right now. It seems to me the warning sign here is there's a lot of public debt coming and you don't really need to chase it. When you look to earnings, it's sort of exuberance all around. I think the policies are in place. The long and variable lags are biting. They will hit. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Well, it wasn't boring, that's for sure. The start of August, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK out today. He's missed. Hopefully he's going to be back for Jobs Day tomorrow morning. Jobs Day just around a corner, 8.30 Eastern time tomorrow morning. The estimate at the moment, 200,000. And Lisa, after the close later, earnings from Apple... And Amazon, and we've hardly talked about it through this morning so far. And I joked that nobody cares about it anymore, and everyone's like, that's ridiculous. Everyone cares about it. But at this point, where does it fit into all of these split narratives that are driving bond yields higher and causing a bit of weakness in some of the areas that have been most bid up so far this year? Tenure yields up every single day so far this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Pick your poison. We've gone through the long list, right? I've forgotten how many things are on it. Better data, ADP, downgrade from Fitch. Extra supply coming out of the Treasury. Bank Japan looking dazed and confused coming into the market, staggering one day out the next, back in the following day. And then you've got yields up and everyone just sitting there making up their own stories about what's happening in the bond market, what it means for equities. That's kind of the last 24 hours, right? I absolutely love your descriptions of the Bank of Japan. Operation Ostrich and dazed and confused. <laughs> These are your descriptions of the Bank of Japan. I've been so critical, I know. But in <laughs> all honesty, what doing. When, but... I, when I speak about them seriously, I do think that they view the inflation lift of the last couple of years very differently to the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB. They don't see it as a problem per se. They see it as a once-in-a-generation opportunity to reset inflation expectations higher. I just think we've got to the point with their monetary policy where the easing has become unsustainable and people think it's been that way for a long, long time. The question we've got to ask ourselves, and you asked this question too in the last week, is the Bank of Japan just tweaking policy to stay dovish for longer or is this truly a baby step towards being tighter and raising interest rates? I don't know. Based on early moves, the one thing I think we can say with some confidence, just a slight degree of confidence, is they're uncomfortable with the pace of the move in the JGB market so far. Regardless of exactly what their goal is, the fact that one of the ballasts of the Treasury market is now in flux just raises yet another question mark. If you think about it, who are the buyers going to be going forward for a U.S. debt load that increases and the Treasury Department is planning to increase the auction sizes going forward at a time when the interest expenses are also increasing? You put this question about Japanese buyers. And the question about whether they'll continue to want to come into treasuries if they get yield at home. You raise questions about China ownership, which has been falling off a cliff just from, a, from that level. You talk about the potential for inflation. All of a sudden, you have a toxic brew that could potentially, oh, that could potentially shift yields a bit higher. TK would love this. I know. I, I did that for him. I'm sure. If you're listening, Tom, I'm sorry. I can't do anything about it. Your equity market on the S&P 500, <laughs> negative by 0.3%. A tough lighter, just a touch lighter, negative here, down by 13, 14 points on the S&P. In the bond market, yields are higher by five basis points, 4.1283. We've wanted to do this conversation all week. It's great to have him with, the, with, him, with us in the building in New York. It's John Stolfus, Chief Investment Strategist over at Oppenheimer. John, good morning to you. Good morning. So nice to be here in studio. Hey, it's great both. to have you back, buddy. Oh. Excited to see you. Price target, 4,900 yes, on the S&P. I want to give you some credit first because the original 4,400 price target was done year-end last year, right? Yes, sir. Looking out. So December you were bullish. 12th, in fact. You were bullish and you were right to be. Now you're even more bullish. Yeah. Tell me why you're even more bullish now. Uh, well, it looks like things are coming together. And uh, it, period of transition, no doubt about it, fear of toxic brews and things like that <laughs> are, uh, uh, when you have changes. But the overall thematic is that, that we would say it, it, it's an end to free money and it's a good thing. Uh, we have been during a period, as a result of the pandemic, we had reached a period of free money, both on the largesse of two administrations in terms of providing uh, 
uh, liquidity, and then the Federal Reserve as well, the Fed, Fed falling behind the curve and all that. Uh, but the good news is the economy is showing remarkable strength if we look at the GDP, okay, uh, based on all that's happening. Corporates are, are navigating through a, a, a transitional period remarkably well with quite a, quite a few sectors still showing good growth. Uh, and then on top of it, the consumer and uh, 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 jobs are remaining remarkably resilient. So with the resilience that we see and this transition, and when we say it's a good thing, free money uh, is not a good thing. If money is uh, costs enough so that corporations have to pay for the privilege of borrowing money and, and bond buyers get something back, CD buyers get something back, this is a healthy environment. It's bad for memes. It's bad for it's bad for cryptocurrencies. We would think ultimately. Uh, we also think it, uh, it it's bad for highly leveraged players, and they will bemoan what's going on. Uh, and you'll hear from them all the time what a bad <laughs> thing it is. But it's a good thing. We've heard it, John. Okay. Oh well, yes, yeah, so far. I know. So let's go through some earnings later. Sure. Apple and Amazon. Yep. Let's go through some weightings. Apple mm -hmm. on the S and P yep. 500, more than seven and a half percent. Of the S and P, Amazon about three percent. So we're getting ten percent of the S and P later, about seventeen percent of the Nasdaq 100. You say the move in yields higher is a good thing. We know year to day, a lot of this move has been multiple expansion. Yes. What's the relationship between what's developing in the bond market and the kind of multiples we should be putting on some of these names? Well, I think I, I think that the fact that the multiples, you know, are, are are up there, they're still not up to nearly 24 times where I think that we hit in 2020. OK, on the forward multiple of the average average five year multiple of the S&P 500, I think it was 2020 when it hit uh, 23.9 or something. We're around 20 right now. Uh, this is, is going to happen at a period like this because the market is looking forward uh, the next six months from here. And we think expectations are that we're going to see uh, continued resilience in earnings. A lot of that comes in from the utilization of cost cutting through additional uh, uh, technology. And it's not the it's not the dream AI that's still up ahead. It's the AI that we have today. It's the robotics and a willingness to to move towards it uh, 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 in, in, by many corporations and the need for it. So we think the the other thing on multiples is you've when you look at the landscape, you've got concerns about social security. And where are people going to put their money? It, it, it should be likely, depending upon their needs and objectives and tolerances to risk, the old disclaimer, uh, is they're going to have to take a look at equities for their intermediate to long-term returns. Fixed income is a great diversifier, and now with the yields that we're seeing, this is healthy, we think. But equities traditionally have been the place where you get your gains not to prepare for retirement, at retirement and during a retirement where one may live longer than one ever expected that one would live. This is a great longer term case yes. for equities. In the short term, mm -hmm. to get to a new record at a time when there are a lot of people decrying the higher yields yeah. and you can say that whatever the motivations are, yes, maybe they are just simply yeah. leveraged and they're talking their own book. Shocker. Yeah. But there is a question about at what point higher yields challenge the case for significantly further gains this year. Worth saying, uh, uh, most certainly was. You know, I've, I've been in this business since 1983. So when I came in, you know, people were still saying that the the rally from August of '82 wouldn't last, and it was going to be the end of the dollar and the end of the, the equity markets. And instead, we had a phenomenal bull market that came out of that. At that time, yields were much higher than they were on a nominal basis. Inflation was higher as well. And uh, equities found ways for profitability, and the stock market moved higher. I can remember speaking with clients and urging them to buy equities, and they'd insist on buying fixed income. And I said, look out for the callability on the corporates, you know. And uh, looking back, you know, I, 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 gosh, I, I was right. And, and that gives me hope here. When, when we speak to people about mortgages, uh, and people are, are bemoaning a, a 7% mortgage. You know, my first mortgage was 10%. My boss's was 16. His boss's was, I think he's got somebody, I don't, I don't know if it was his boss, but it was someone that had a 22% mortgage. And we all lived through it. And, and the Fed has been remarkably good. It can make mistakes. No, It's not infallible. But the Fed overall has been remarkably good at taming inflation, and also, during that period, we had deflation or disinflation that came up. It's remarkably good overall uh, over the long term if the leadership is good.
Does your bull case lose some of its luster if the Adam Posen world, we were just speaking with Adam Posen about the idea that inflation might stay around 3 percent and the Fed might tolerate that, does that change your bull case? No, it doesn't. In, in fact, 3 percent inflation would be, when we, when we think the target of 2 percent, uh, we, when we often wonder, well, why does the Fed really want to go back to that? We can remember when economists just a few years ago were, again, bemoaning seems to be an operative word of the day. It was they were they were bemoaning uh, the fact that growth was at, at, at 2 percent, inflation was at, at less than 2 percent. And they said uh, an economy the size of the U.S. needs 3 to 4 percent, be careful what you wish for, to, to grow. So we'd have to say three. We, at four, we don't, we don't want to look at four. But we can remember during the Greenspan era when the target was four and we said, gosh, if we, if we could get 4% inflation down to four, we'll, go, we'll sign up for life. <laughs> You know, it, everything is relative. It's 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 the it, it, what we hope we can bring. You know, the, the old timers in this market is a sense of context to all of this, and in that sense, that's what keeps us bullish at this point. And being wrong is hard, and sometimes it's just part of the job. We would have these conversations through last year. Yes. Your call didn't work out, and I would ask you things like, "What are you learning? What are the lessons yeah. you've taken from the year so far?" When you're right, like you are yep. and have been through the year so far, what are the lessons you're learning now, as uh, you work through your process? What are the kind of mistakes you can make by extrapolating things out, extrapolating things out too far too soon? Those kind of things. What are you learning at the moment? Oh, terrific. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it, it, the, the, what we've learned, especially in, it, over the course of the last few years, is anything can happen. Anything that can happen that can create a catalyst uh, for bears and skeptics to take profits without FOMO, okay, during a period like this where, you're, where you've are you got a secular bull likely driven by technology that can benefit all 11 sectors, okay? That's the underlying theme. But you have to be careful. So you need to be diversified across market capitalizations. You want quality. Uh, you want to have representation in fixed income at the short end of the curve for an equity buyer like myself. If you're uh, if you're a bond buyer, you can you can even look at laddering, or you can go up and within corporates probably to the, to the MTN uh, range, and tax frees look good. Okay, but uh, it it would be one that it, it certainly is diversification remains key, patience and right sized expectations, because these markets are highly prone to rotation and rebalancing, because of the technology. The communication, both uh, not only within the markets, but by the Federal Reserve itself. What a journey, John. Hey, last couple of years have been nuts. John Stolf is there of Oppenheimer. John, thank you. Thanks thank for being you. with us. And it's good Great to see you in person back. in a studio. 4,900 price target on the S&P 500. Credit where it's due. Had a 4,400 price target in the middle of December last year, looking out. 12 months to this year and we're through that equity futures on the S&P 500 if you're just joining welcome to the program we're negative here by 0.3 percent yields are a little bit higher again by six basis points your 10 year 414 looking forward to hearing what Tom Porcelli of PGM has got to say about this he joins us in about 20 minutes time Tom has a new seat so that's very cool Tom's going to join us to break down what he's doing over at PGM and what he's seeing in this labor market with jobless claims Lisa just around the corner I'm very excited to speak with uh, Tom about his new role I also want to let you know that one viewer wrote in to let me know that there are still traders uh, in the JGB market and that they know some of them personally and that it's very difficult because the banks good. don't want to make markets but that some people have made a job of just simply buying things and turning around and selling them to the Bank of Japan right that is basically the job <laughs> that's literally what the job is and likewise with ETFs yes correct and then the question is how wide are those markets and right now can can you imagine how wide those markets are as they try to game out what levels the Bank of Japan is going to step in? I mentioned this last week. If you can, go and have a look at the size of net interest margins at Japanese banks. Compare them to the NIMS over on US banks and think about what they could do if we started to get some rate hikes from the PRJ, which is why the Japanese equity market's been picking up. I want to know who's going to say the call, go into Japanese banks to bet that there's going to be a higher yield. Oh, we've heard it. Oh, we've yeah, heard we it. People people seem to like Japanese equities this year hearing it more banks. and more maybe banks based on what we've seen sure exactly. if that's your call I don't make calls equities <laughs> a little bit negative from New York this is Bloomberg inflation will we believe continue to fall over the coming months that reflects the fact that monetary policy is restrictive it's working to bring inflation down. Our job is to make absolutely sure that inflation falls all the way back 
to the 2% target and stays low. I make it sound really boring in the process, Andrew Bailey, Bank of England <laughs> Governor. Hasn't that been like the mission of every single one of them over the last week? Yes. Bailey, Lagarde, Powell, just make it sound dull, dull, dull. Because they've got nothing to say. Zero. They don't know what to say. They honestly are not on a trajectory that they can spell out because they can't agree. And the Bank of England at least was transparent about that lack of agreement. Governor Bailey said this, wait for this, won't judge what the path of rates should be. It's kind of their job, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? Well, yes, that's exactly what they're supposed to be. And then they're saying, well, data dependency, which raises right. the question, what's the data? And does the data matter more? And then we've gotten a couple of elements of data. And the market hasn't responded all that much. So in this new data dependency, people are not sure where to look. And so they're making up their own minds. We will act on rates based on how the data turns out. Right. Data yeah, data. and that could have been Lagarde, that could have been Powell, the but it's thing. Bailey this morning. You heard what Adam Poston said. Maybe they're not done over the Bank of England after hiking 25 basis points about an hour and 20 minutes ago. Let's run through the price action. Sterling is negative off the back of that decision, negative by 0.5%. The pound against the US dollar, 126.51. If you are just tuning in, you want to hear about where the bond market is, I can tell you where it's trading. Yields are higher by seven basis points on a 10-year, 415. Lisa, new highs for 2023 at the long end of the curve. And the, really the move has been at the long end of the curve. To me, this is the story of the moment. How far could it go? And at what point does it really undermine risk appetite in a material way? We were just talking to John Stoltzfus, who still is making the bull case, but we hear from many other people who say it starts to really pressure things, and that's what we're seeing in the market today. Really odd moment, isn't it, down in Washington? For us, anyway, we were obsessed with what was happening with the bond market, for good reason, what was happening with the downgrade. The legal issues surrounding what could be the two front runners for the presidential race next year of the president, former president, Donald Trump. And then you've got the business dealings of the president's son all mixed in elsewhere. At least there's a bit of a mess down in Washington. Yeah, and the legal issues are not analogous in any way. But what we are looking at are two uh, candidates who have a lot of hair on them, who are someone who come in with a lot of baggage and they have haters and they have uh, their stalwarts. And how does this come together in an incredibly unpopular election of Trump v. Biden, which nobody really wants to see. And yet that's probably what it looks like we may get. Elisa on this afternoon, the team of Banners of Power, Anne-Marie, Joe Matthew, Kelly Lines, at 4 p.m. Eastern time will be responding to the President of the United States, the former President, Donald Trump, expected to appear in a Washington federal court to face new charges, the latest this week, that he conspired to obstruct the 2020 presidential election. Joining us now is Elaine Kmark, senior fellow at Brookings and former Clinton administration official. Elaine, just walk me through what you'll be looking for later on today and in the weeks ahead. Well, later on today, I think we'll see Trump being indicted. It'll be historic, but it's also happened twice before um, to this same man. So that that's not going to be any big deal. I think what I'm going to be looking for in the weeks to come is what happens to him in the Republican primaries. Um, remember that the primary system in America is unlike any other election in American politics because it is a sequence of elections. And I'll bring you back to 1984. Uh, one of the first candidates I ever worked for as a young woman was Walter Mondale. He got a whopping 49% in the Iowa caucuses. Everybody else was way behind him. But there was a young man named Gary Hart who got 17%. And Gary Hart became the winner of the next primary, New Hampshire, and, and went on to give Mondale a, a run for his money through the entire nomination system. So what happens in the nomination system is somebody emerges as the alternative. And my guess is, and I'll make a I'll go out on a limb and make a prediction, is that somebody's going to emerge to be the non-Trump candidate in the Republican primaries. Trump can lose the Republican nomination. Because remember, what's going to be happening is as these primaries are going on, the court cases are going to unfold. And we're going to be learning more and more about Trump himself and what what he did, particularly in the run-up to January 6th. If that happens and there is another candidate that emerges, what does that do to Biden's chances of getting reelected? Biden's in trouble if there's anybody but Trump. Let's face it. Um, Biden has low approval ratings. There's a lot of doubts that stem from his age. I don't share those doubts, but people have them. 
Um, and so if we had what we call what we're calling in Washington, a normal Republican, if there was a normal Republican who would win the nomination, um, I think that Biden stands a chance of losing. As it is, remember that Trump has effectively been on the ballot in 2020, 2021 with those Georgia Senate races and 2022. Every time he's been on the ballot, either in person or as a representative of, of some Trump endorsed candidates, he's lost. Um, being indicted three times may hold on to his core Trump supporters, but it certainly is not expanding his number of voters in the electorate. And so I think Biden, I think Trump is basically in trouble, if not in the in the primaries, definitely in the general election. A normal Republican, different story. I think then the race becomes more about the incumbent as it usually is. Do you think then that the Democrats should be talking more seriously about another candidate other than Biden to possibly step in or to be there just in case there is this dynamic that you're predicting will transpire in the Republican Party? No, I don't think so. It is awfully disruptive uh, for a political party to throw over the president, their current president. Look at the Republicans in 1976 when they when they tried to do that to President Ford. It, it's it's very disruptive. It hurts them in the end. I think Democrats say, look. Joe has done a pretty good job. The economy's in pretty decent shape. Um, we got through COVID. Uh, he's he's handling uh, the Ukraine masterfully. Um, let's just stick with this guy. He's solid. And I think Democrats are going to stick with him. Um, again, it's a lot easier for him to beat Donald Trump than it is for him to beat a normal Republican. But Democrats are definitely not going to abandon their president. Can we reflect on 1992 just for a second? Who should fear the prospect of a credible third party candidate more? Oh, Biden should. There's no doubt about it. I mean, look, Trump has from from the minute he came down that escalator, he has adopted a policy of just sticking to his base. That's all he does. He's never tried to expand that base. That base is old. OK, Trump voters are older than the rest of the electorate, which means, of course, that there are fewer and fewer of them with every succeeding election. So that's an old base. Um, and I think that in 1992, we saw how damaging a third party could be. And in this coming year, I think a third party can be very damaging to Biden because people kind of looking for an alternative might decide. Also, Remember how small the margins for Democrats are. They were extremely small in those races that, that Democrats picked up in 2022. They were extremely small in the races that um, gave Biden the Electoral College in 2020. And so any third party is apt to hurt Biden more than Trump. Interesting. Elaine, thank you for your perspective. Elaine Kamak there of Brookings. Lisa, I hear more and more about that the prospect that maybe you do get that credible third party candidate. And it would probably hurt uh, President Biden, as we were just hearing from Elaine. Depends who it is. Right. Well, but it depends who it is and it depends who's on the other side of it. Right. I mean, Precisely. that's the question, because especially if she thinks that President uh, President Biden will not be facing off with a former President Trump, then who will it be? And could it be somebody who is uh, a bit more of a contender in more traditional ways? It's going to be a fascinating race. We're going to talk lots about it. It's going to happen. Three weeks away, the first debate for presidential hopefuls. Will the president turn up? Some suspicion that maybe he might. So since I am sitting in this chair, I the should say. The former president, I should say. <laughs> so I should say, you know, they just do it better in the UK. Yeah, it's just TK. shorter. You know, that's sort of what he'll say. I mean, that's basically, you know, but we've got long time to drag this out. Future slightly negative from New York. This is Bloomberg. Focus on bond yields this morning, especially on the heels of uh, what we saw, which is 40 basis points of moves in just days. We're talking and we're looking at Andrew Hollenhorst coming out and saying this is when financial conditions actually start to tighten. Right now, we're just moments away from the latest slew of economic data. Uh, the unemployment uh, claims at a time when they've come in light repeatedly with a strong jobs market really underpinning some of the moves right now with some of the numbers just crossing. Michael McKee our ex-correspondent, Mike. 
Well, everybody's clicking on the jobless numbers, so they haven't come down yet because the computers are all tied up. But let's do non-farm productivity comes in much better than expected, up 3.7 percent. That's after a 2.1 percent decline in the first quarter. Uh, unit labor costs, therefore, fall. Uh, they rise just 1.6 percent, down from a 4.2 percent increase in the first uh, quarter of the year. Still waiting on the uh, jobless claims numbers to come in. In here, uh, the, uh, they switch to this uh, all distribution by computer, so everybody clicking at the same time. Or it could be that, you know, they're not uh, – <laughs> the <laughs> well, Department of Labor's computer is uh, – Filing for something. For filing for something else and, and having a bit of an issue. Uh, just as we take a look, though, at the non farm productivity, there is a question ah. about what higher productivity will do to some of these costs going forward, as well as just in general employment. Well, the, empl the, the productivity numbers are key for the Fed because we've seen average hourly earnings rise significantly as productivity has fallen, so it costs more to make less. And if productivity is rising, then that brings down down the danger of the wages and people can make more money without uh, the Fed having a problem. Now, here's the jobless claims numbers. 227, that's from an unrevised 221 the week before. Uh, the ongoing uh, continuing claims, 1,700,000, that's up from 1,679. So a slight increase in continuing claims and a slight increase in initial jobless claims, basically telling you that nothing has changed in the labor market as far as the layoffs business goes. Uh, we're still at extremely low levels, and the Fed is going to look at that and say things are still pretty tight. Which is a reason why perhaps you're seeing uh, just some fuel to the move that we already had been seeing. Just taking a look quickly. Initially, on the productivity numbers, actually, you did see a bit of a dip in two-year yields. The idea here being that going forward, inflation could moderate even with a robust labor market. And they've retraced that a little bit. Just small, small moves. Pretty much status quo. 30-year yields, though, I'm looking at, which we don't normally quote on a regular basis. But because of the move, uh, still holding near session highs of nearly 4.3%. 4.26%. Uh, so this really highlighting uh, the move that we've seen more generally. Mike, just quickly, how much in this newly data-dependent central bank world does this sort of underscore this feeling that this move in the bond market could continue, that there is sort of protracted strength that could fuel inflation, or does it not really tell us anything? I don't think it tells us as much as people might want it to think. Uh, certainly a lot of this was driven by the increase in supply that we saw. And the fact that we've had people sort of uh, in the bond market like a coiled spring with the inverted yield curve waiting for some signal that things are going to turn terrible. And so you get this uh, brief overreaction. I think tomorrow will be much more telling when we get the jobs numbers. Then you have something really to hold on to. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, just crossing the wire a short time ago, Tom Barkin, the Richmond Fed president, said, yes, we're going to have a slowdown. And we'll have a recession someday, but it doesn't look imminent. And he made it a very interesting point, and that is that this recession has been called for for so long, and we all joke about that, that companies have prepared for it in ways they don't usually, because a recession usually comes on as a shock. And in this case, they have reduced their inventories, they're streamlining costs, and they're holding on to workers uh, without maybe hiring more. So if, if we do have a recession, it could be short and shallow, he says. That's fascinating. Michael McKee, stay close, please. Uh, we'll catch up with you in just a little bit, and thank you for that. As we take a look at some of these numbers and which will matter and how quickly things we could turn over, I am so excited to bring in Tom Parcelli. Tom Parcelli has been uh, off for a bit, and now yes. you're in a new seat. Yes. Chief U.S. Economist at PGM Fixed Income. This is your first interview. Welcome. Thank you. You've had some time off. I have had some time off. You look um, incredibly rested. I feel it, too. It's all the yoga. <laughs> well, in your new, you know, awesome. yogic state of <laughs> Buddhist uh, reflection. Exactly. When you come back in, you had previously been talking about how the Fed was probably sufficiently restrictive, to yes. use their words, yep. and didn't need to hike further. They have hiked further. Yeah. People are talking about maybe they haven't hiked enough and that there is momentum underpinning some of the inflation and the market yes. that previously had been underappreciated. Yep. What's your view? 
Yeah, look, I, so first of all, thank you. Good to be here. Um, good to be sitting at PGIM. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been great so far uh, in my grand total of three weeks, um, but it's been, it's been awesome, great team. Um, yeah, look, I think that, you know, my, my, my view in that regard hasn't really changed much. I mean, I, I think that in so many ways, I, I, I think that the Fed was fighting yesterday's war on inflation. Um, I mean, inflation is softening. Um, you know, I, I think what we need to make a distinction here between, though, is, you know, and I think Powell laid this out so perfectly, uh, which I haven't said many times, but I, th I think he nailed it. Um, I think, you know, what you want to see is inflation slow credibly and sustainably. Um, th those are his words. And, and I, think that's, I think that's where we're going. So I, I think the, the sort of the, the construct around that, though, is does that mean you have to get to 2%? And I think the answer to that is, I don't think we do. I, I, I think that's the ultimate objective. But I don't think that that is a roadblock to the Fed cutting rates at some point. And we can still see a scenario where the Fed actually is cutting rates um, you know, sort of sooner than later. I mean, not, it's not necessarily this year idea. But I can see a scenario where the labor backdrop is, is, is slowly deteriorating, which it is right now. I mean, jobless claims notwithstanding, you know, we're in sort of a funky seasonal window for those. Um, but I think if you get toward the end of the year, and if the Fed's forecast for the unemployment rate materializes, um, and if their inflation forecast materializes, I think that might be enough for the Fed to say, hey, you know what, maybe we're going to take back some of this aggressive accommodation. And if they did that, I, I, it could, could be fuel to the fire from an economic perspective. I mean, you can actually have, wind up having a really good 24. So it's a, sort of an interesting thing that we've been kicking around. There's something you said that yeah. builds on what Adam Posen was talking about that's really important to highlight, that inflation may be okay at yeah. 3%. And the Fed may even verbally acknowledge this, yeah. that they're OK with this and they are not willing to compromise the labor market in order to get inflation down to the prior target. Are you expecting that to be explicit by the Federal Reserve? I, I don't think that they can say that explicitly. I, because and I think all of a sudden it throws into sort of question the, the credibility around inflation and, and, the, and the inflation target, which, let's just be clear, the inflation target is literally a finger in the air, right? I mean, I, there, there's no real literature that says 2% is the number. Um, I, I think. The, the narrative is, I can see a narrative evolving this way. It's really easy to say that you're going to beat the heck out of inflation um, when the unemployment rate's sitting at the lows. Um, I think it's a completely different dynamic when it, un, the unemployment rate is actually starting to drift higher. Um, and that's a scenario that we could easily see play out over the course of the um, c coming year or so. So I think that's how the Fed is going to be able to justify, hey, look, the credibly and sustainably idea, it's happening. We're, we're seeing it actually drift lower. Um, but now we have to start to worry about the other side of the mandate, the, the labor mandate, and we can easily start to take back some of this accommodation, uh, some of this tightening. I think that's how the narrative can. So I don't think it has to be like this big, weepy, hey, we have to cut. Um, I think it could be, hey, we're going to cut because we want to extend the cycle. There is a larger question here yeah. about what that means about interest rate sensitivity of this economy yeah. and whether we're in a new paradigm where <laughs> there isn't necessarily the same kind of sensitivity yep. and rates can be higher for a longer period of time. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're seeing? Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, one of my uh, one of my prior bosses love to tell the story about how they how they knew that the Fed cut rates, right? It wasn't as simple as looking at your 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 Bloomberg screen. I mean, you literally had to go to the Fed, you had to get one of the H reports, you had to do all this analysis, and this all happened over the course of multiple days. Um, what why do I highlight that? Because in a in in an age where Fed officials relentlessly have a microphone in front of them, um, this notion of forward guidance I think is very real. Um, so I think the the Fed can impact the term structure much further out. Um, and so I think in that context, yes, I think, you know, the Dudley piece that a lot of people were talking about, I think that that's fair. I think that, you know, the, the economy feels the effect of this much quicker. I, I would add one other thing, though, that's really important. Um, and, and maybe this is blunting the blow of this. You think about corporations. Corporations are sitting on a mountain of cash, and they've termed out a lot of their debt. Right, so you don't have that impact right now, and I think that's really an important idea. And I think, and I'm sorry, I'll be really quick on this. I think that's an important idea because when I think about labor and the possible deterioration, th th thank goodness we got that productivity number because productivity has been poor. And when you think about the hoarding idea, and 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 Mike mentioned this, and I think this is such an important idea. I think the hoarding idea could actually come back to haunt the labor backdrop. 
Because if you have hoarding that's taken place as productivity is actually not performing that well, all in the context of companies' ability to pass on prices, which is now diminishing, um, all in the context of consumption, which is you know sort of pretty soft, what do companies do to defend profit margins? They will tend to go after labor. So I think it's a really interesting idea um, that is not being talked about enough. Um, and yeah, sure, I think that the, these companies probably have um, deflected some of that because they've been able to term out debt and they're sitting on a mountain of cash. It's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's an interesting idea. That's that, that is fascinating. Yeah. Going forward, as we take a look at when that recession does come to pass, yep. everyone seems to be pushing out their yep. expectation of that. Definitely. Have you as well? Yeah, so um, our our call at, at PGM is that we, we do not suffer through a recession, that it's really more of a this sort of, we're calling it weak flation. Um, it's, you know, it's a, a dynamic where um, uh, inflation remains north of target, but growth remains pretty sluggish. Um, and that's what we expect over the coming year. Um, the risk to that is what I've just highlighted. If, if companies actually um, decide, OK, margins have compressed enough, um, you know, we're going to have to take it out of somewhere, that's a risk to the labor backdrop, um, to be sure. But, but I, I, I like our view that, um, that, that things are probably going to hold, um, hold in there and not go through the recession um, line. I, I would say one quick thing, if I can. You know, it's interesting, this idea of, of recession um, and it not materializing. It's been interesting. One of the things that we've talked about, and again, this is um, a view that we have now at PGM, is this sort of, you know, it's almost like a mid-cycle slowdown sort of dynamic, right? Like 94, 95. Um, and that's something we've been talking about at, at my, in my prior job. Um, and I, I, think, I think about that today um, and, and for some of the recession calls out there. Think about the things that were in recession, right? Consumer spending on goods was in recession. Um, housing was in recession. CapEx, right, was down, what, in two of the last four quarters. So there's, there were a lot of segments of the economy that actually were performing really poorly. It just didn't all sort of conspire at the same time. So it's just, again, another interesting sort of angle on that idea. Tom Whatever Porcelli. that's worth. Tom Porcelli, wonderful to catch up with you. Congratulations. You. Tom Porcelli of PGM Fixed Income joining us here. If you're just joining the program right now, uh, we are looking at a bit of softness following on the biggest daily decline yesterday, going back to April. S&P lower by about three-tenths of a percent. Well, Michael McKee, our economics correspondent, has been plowing through all of the data as well as the uh, the productivity numbers, which I think might be actually more interesting than the unemployment claims, frankly. Uh, Mike, what's the latest? Well, I think what we're looking at here is a kind of a turnaround with growth stronger than expected and wages starting to flatten out. We're seeing unit labor costs drop. Uh, that's going to be the most important thing for the Fed here is that uh, they're not seeing a wage price spiral. Now, it's interesting uh, because as uh, Tom mentioned, the many sort of rolling recessions we've had, Tom Barkin, the Richmond Fed president, making exactly the same point today, saying maybe that's what we get instead of an overall recession, because uh, he said the pandemic is still with us. The Not the disease so much, but the impact on the economy, which nobody can quite get their hands around. I thought what you said, his comments around companies preparing for the most telegraphed recession in the history of economics was really telling, too. They're trying to examine the ways in which this time really is different. Well, and you look today, a CEO survey is out, and they're more optimistic about the, the third quarter and the fourth quarter than they were. So maybe people are beginning to think, even if we get a slowdown, we're going to be okay. If that's the case, then there's a real question longer term about where inflation does settle out. Michael McKee, thank you. Coming up, we'll have much more, including discussion around Apple and Amazon. We haven't even been talking about them and their reporting earnings. They account for about 17 percent of the S&P, just to give you a sense uh, of how significant they are. Essentially, the Nasdaq, as we all know, started ripping at the trough in, in March. And then in June, when you got to 4,200 in the S&P 500, that's when the participation started to broaden. That's when we turned more optimistic and moved our price target up to 4,450. It wouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise if we retest that 4,200 level at some point. So potentially a little bit of bearishness, but that will be a buying opportunity. That is the tone that we're hearing uh, throughout the day, certainly from Julian Emanuel there, chief equity and quantitative strategist at Evercore ISI. Meanwhile, in markets, we did just get uh, the unemployment claims as well as productivity numbers. It didn't really move the dial that much, although a lot of people will be scrutinizing this for tea leaves as to what we get for the jobs 
figure that we get tomorrow. S&P futures lower by three-tenths of a percent. I am still watching very much, as was John, throughout the morning. Ten-year yields, 4.14 percent, up uh, now at seven basis points as people parse through the supply-demand dynamics and some of this better-than-expected data. We've also been getting a, a series of earnings, and so I do want to just run through some of the themes that we've been hearing through the lenses of some of these companies, although the stock moves are more reflective of what the companies have done year to date. Right now, what we see, TripAdvisor shares lower by 1.7 percent, MGM Resorts lower by 6.6 percent. Both of them beat across the board. This, to me, is really in, uh, important to highlight. They actually showed increased revenues, increased profits relative to expectations, and yet they're being punished based on their performance, although TripAdvisor is down on the year. MGM, perhaps, people are worried that Las Vegas isn't going to come as much of a revival as people had previously expected. Also, just with respect to consumer spending, Zillow shares, Shake Shack, Etsy, Warner Brothers, all of them lower on the day. Again, this goes to the question of have we built in too much enthusiasm about consumer spending and how long it can continue to go? This comes even with a number of beats. Again, they're getting punished for not beating by more, by not having even better expectations. But really, the bigger story that a lot of people are looking for is what has been baked into Amazon and Apple. They report after the bell, Amazon is up 53% year to date. Apple is up 48% year to date. How high are expectations? How high are the desires to see something said about artificial intelligence, about demand continuing to increase? With Apple in particular, I'm curious, given Qualcomm's earnings, where they really gave disappointing projections at a time when there's a question about the recovery in the smartphone sector, as well as demand over in China. Joining us now to talk about all of what to expect and how to understand it within the spectrum of all of the earnings that we've seen is Anurag Rana, senior technology analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Anurag, thank you so much for being with us. I want to start there. When you take a look at, for example, Apple, how much are you looking at the smartphone cycle and how much are you looking at Apple as the juggernaut in a market that is completely dominated by the iPhone? Yeah, if you look at from Apple's point of view, it's it doesn't really go up and down in terms of cyclicality based on what's happening in the smartphone market because it's a higher price point uh, product, and uh, you know people who buy that really don't uh, you know change their buying habits. They buy it when they need it. But frankly speaking, this is going to be a very boring quarter for Apple when it comes to new iPhone shipments because um, next quarter is or next month is when the next uh, iPhone is going to be launched, and that really spurs the big uh, upgrade cycle that will come in the December quarter. So really, it's you know from our side, it's going to be a bit boring when it comes to Apple. I think what we really want to hear about it have we seen a rebound in the services business? Uh, that's where the higher margin is. That's where uh, some of the growth is. But overall, I'm, I'm not expecting any major surprises on the upside or the downside for Apple. Has too much been baked in, though, with respect to hopes of some sort of artificial intelligence announcement or a new product? Is this basically uh, something that can't really meet the expectations that the stock rally has given it? No, I don't think there is a AI story here per se. In a sense that they're not going to be launching any new products. What's going to happen with Apple is a lot of their, you know, the operating system will have new enhancements, which they always do every year. Um, that will have new capabilities. You know, something like live transcription. When you ask Siri some questions, it's going to get smarter over time. But that's a natural progression of uh, just the product development. We are not expecting any major AI announcement for either from Apple or from Amazon. Meanwhile, at Amazon, people are looking very much to cloud spending at a time when there were some questions around that with Microsoft and Azure. How much are you looking at that specifically to understand what companies are willing to spend to build out some of their cloud services at a time when there have been sort of conflicting signals? Yeah, we are not expecting cloud to be uh, strong or uh, rebound. We actually think they even may guide to slower growth next quarter. But having said that, you know, probably next quarter, could be an area where we see the bottom of this uh, growth rate and that we can perhaps uh, start looking for a rebound over the next 12 months. Largely, is a factor of easier comparisons. But when it comes to um, cloud usage, I think we all know that IT spending has been slowing down for some time. Microsoft, I think, um, you know, the, partially the reason the stock had a negative reaction was because people were expecting a rebound in those sales. And uh, we are not seeing that at this point.
So given that, how much is there other business really doing well at a time when we are seeing some questions around the delivery services? I'm thinking about Uber, for example, which their their down spot really was the freight, this issue of packages just not being in the same kind of number as they used to be. You know, Shopify reported last night and they showed it's really good uh, GMV growth. I think Amazon should report a similar number in, a term, in, a, in, in, in the sense of growth rate compared to last year. Given uh, you know as big they are, their uh, the size of the growth may not be even close to that. But you know, frankly speaking, from Amazon's point of view, the investments they made during the pandemic on shipping will start to see benefits. We are already starting to see benefits in some regions uh, of the country, but shipping is going to be a big differentiator for them over the next two to three years. So a lot of people are paying a very close attention to everything that Amazon and Apple have to say, in large part because they are such behemoths in the indexes. They account for a significant portion of uh, the total. And there's a question, especially as you say, everything's going to be pretty much in line. What's going to move the needle in a way that could shift sentiment for the entire market in a meaningful way? See, I would say the you know entire tech market has been fueled by a lot of optimism around AI and what it could do. But frankly speaking, these two companies are not taking part on a lot of those discussion, largely because you know Microsoft has a very close relationship with OpenAI and ChatGPT because it runs on Microsoft's back end. But for Amazon, they really need to come out and talk about what is going to be their best strategy going forward in terms of allowing people to build more AI applications on their platform. You know, from Apple's point of view, they have to come out and tell people that they're not going to see any more supply chain hiccups in the next three months, which is, I mean, obviously the most important quarter uh, going into next year for them is the fourth quarter of calendar year uh, this year. Um, that is really the thing that we are looking for to make sure that there are no problems uh, for the new iPhone Pro or the, the Pro Max when it comes out and, and you know, people can buy it at the, at the right time. What are you expecting to hear from Apple about China at a time when they are looking to that for part of the expansion, and we heard the opposite story from Qualcomm. Yeah, from a China point of view, again, I think last year was a point where they had really bad sales in that area because of some COVID-related stuff. You know, this year we think there should be again a rebound over there because the numbers were so low in in calendar fourth quarter of last year. You know, we should see a rebound over there. Uh, you know, once again, from a Chinese consumer point of view, you know, people who can afford to buy a you know Burberry bag or an LV bag. They are the ones who are buying the the higher end iPhone models, and the the rumor is that the new iPhone 15 Pro Max, which is the highest of the high end, will have a you know phenomenal camera. And our analysts in Asia think that's going to be a big growth driver uh, for the Chinese smartphone market uh, from the higher end point of view. So these last two big tech companies will really wrap up the entirety of the FANG or the fan mag uh, stocks, as I like to call them. What's going to be the big takeaway as we assess all of their earnings as a whole? See, for me, the big takeaway is that uh, the AI is story is real, but it's going to take several years to play out. It's not going to be that in two quarters you're going to you know, start seeing massive uh, revenue upside. And, and Microsoft, I think, is the biggest example because uh, in the software world, they are perceived to be the biggest beneficiary of this. But you know, with that big rally in the last you know, six months, the stock only was down 3-4% after the earnings. So I think people are getting the point that it is going to take some time for that revenue to be recognized. Yeah. Um, and I think that's yeah. the big story uh, for all of us. Anurag Grana, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's going to be a very busy day for you. Anurag Grana of Bloomberg Intelligence. I do want to just bring you a headline just crossing that Saudi Arabia will extend its voluntary cut of one million barrels per day through September. This according to SPA. And when you take a look, you do see uh, a spike upward in Brent up 1 percent. We're looking now at $84.05 over traded on the NYMEX. Crude is up uh, 1.2 percent, $80.04. 47. Saudi says voluntary oil cut can be extended and deepened, raising questions about supply and demand. Coming up on Bloomberg Television at 11 a.m., an interview with Andrew Bailey, Bank of England governor. We'll be also keeping track of oil prices in response to some of these latest disclosures from Saudi Arabia. This is Bloomberg.